wonder when I told her what I thought of her performance, and she seemed quite unconscious of her power. I think we were both rather nervous. The old Jew stood grinning at the doorway of the dusty green room, making elaborate speeches about us both, while we stood looking at each other like children. He would insist on calling me my lord, so I had to assure Sybil that I was not anything of the kind. She said quite simply to me, You look more like a prince. I must call you Prince Charming. Upon my word, Dorian, Miss Sybil knows how to pay compliments. You don't understand her, Harry. She regarded me merely as a person in a play. She knows nothing of life. She lives with her mother, a faded, tired woman who played Lady Capulet in a sort of magenta dressing wrapper on the first night and looks as if she had seen better days. I know that look. It depresses me, murmured Lord Henry, examining his rings. The Jew wanted to tell me her history, but I said it did not interest me. You were quite right. There is always something infinitely mean about other people's tragedies. Sybil is the only thing I care about. What is it to me where she came from, from her little head to her little feet? She is absolutely and entirely divine. Every night of my life I go to see her act, and every night she is more marvellous. That is the reason, I suppose, that you never dine with me now. I thought you must have some curious romance on hand. You have, but it is not quite what I expected. My dear Harry, we either lunch or sup together every day, and I have been to the opera with you several times, said Dorian, opening his blue eyes in wonder. You always come dreadfully late. Well, I can't help going to see Sybil play, he cried. Even if it is only for a single act, I get hungry for her presence, and when I think of the wonderful soul that is hidden away in that little ivory body, I am filled with awe. You can dine with me tonight, Dorian, can't you? He shook his head. Tonight she is Imogen, he answered, and tomorrow night she will be Juliet. When is she Sybil Vane? Never. I congratulate you. How horrid you are. She is all the great heroines of the world in one. She is more than an individual. You laugh, but I tell you she has genius. I love her and I must make her love me. You, who know all the secrets of life, tell me how to charm Sybil Vane to love me. I want to make Romeo jealous. I want the dead lovers of the world to hear our laughter and grow sad. I want a breath of our passion to stir their dust into consciousness, to wake their ashes into pain. My God, Harry, how I worship her! He was walking up and down the room as he spoke. Hectic spots of red burned on his cheeks. He was terribly excited. Lord Henry watched him with a subtle sense of pleasure. How different he was now from the shy, frightened boy he had met in Basil Hallward's studio. His nature had developed like a flower, had borne blossoms of scarlet flame. Out of its secret hiding place had crept his soul, and desire had come to meet it on the way. And what do you propose to do? said Lord Henry at last. I want you and Basil to come with me some night and see her act. I have not the slightest fear of the result. You are certain to acknowledge her genius. Then we must get her out of the Jew's hands. She is bound to him for three years, at least for two years and eight months from the present time. I shall have to pay him something, of course. When all that is settled, I shall take a West End theatre and bring her out properly. She will make the world as mad as she has made me. That would be impossible, my dear boy. Yes, she will. She has not merely art, consummate art instinct in her, but she has personality also. And you have often told me that it is personalities, not principles, that move the age. Well, what night shall we go? Let me see. Today is Tuesday. Let us fix tomorrow. She plays Juliet tomorrow. All right. The Bristol at eight o'clock, and I will get Basil. Not eight, Harry, please. Half past six. We must be there before the curtain rises. You must see her in the first act where she meets Romeo. Half past six? What an hour. It will be like having a meat tea or reading an English novel. It must be seven. No gentleman dines before seven. Shall you see Basil between this and then, or shall I write to him? Dear Basil, I have not laid eyes on him for a week. It is rather horrid of me, as he has sent me my portrait in the most wonderful frame, specially designed by himself, and though I am a little jealous of the picture for being a whole month younger than I am, I must admit that I delight in it. Perhaps you had better write to him. I don't want to see him alone. He says things that annoy me. He gives me good advice. Lord Henry smiled. People are very fond of giving away what they need most themselves. It is what I call the depth of generosity. Oh, Basil is the best of fellows, but he seems to me to be just a bit of a philistine. Since I have known you, Harry, I have discovered that. 
Basil, my dear boy, puts everything that is charming in him into his work. The consequence is that he has nothing left for life but his prejudices, his principles, and his common sense. The only artists I have ever known who are personally delightful are bad artists. Good artists exist simply in what they make, and consequently are perfectly uninteresting in what they are. A great poet, a really great poet, is the most unpoetical of all creatures. But inferior poets are absolutely fascinating. The worse their rhymes are, the more picturesque they look. The mere fact of having published a book of second-rate sonnets makes a man quite irresistible. He lives the poetry that he cannot write. The others write the poetry that they dare not realise. I wonder, is that really so, Harry? said Dorian Gray, putting some perfume on his handkerchief out of a large gold-topped bottle that stood on the table. It must be if you say it. And now I am off. Imogen is waiting for me. Don't forget about tomorrow. Goodbye. As he left the room, Lord Henry's heavy eyelids drooped, and he began to think. Certainly few people had ever interested him so much as Dorian Gray, and yet the lad's mad adoration of someone else caused him not the slightest pang of annoyance or jealousy. He was pleased by it. It made him a more interesting study. He had been always enthralled by the methods of natural science, but the ordinary subject matter of that science had seemed to him trivial and of no import. And so he had begun by vivisecting himself, as he had ended by vivisecting others. Human life, that appeared to him the one thing worth investigating. Compared to it, there was nothing else of any value. It was true that as one watched life in its curious crucible of pain and pleasure, one could not wear over one's face a mask of glass, nor keep the sulphurous fumes from troubling the brain and making the imagination turbid with monstrous fancies and misshapen dreams. They were poisons so subtle that to know their properties one had to sicken of them. They were maladies so strange that one had to pass through them if one sought to understand their nature. And yet, what a great reward one received. How wonderful the whole world became to one. To note the curious hard logic of passion and the emotional coloured life of the intellect. To observe where they met and where they separated, at what point they were in unison and at what point they were at discord. There was a delight in that. What matter what the cost was, one could never pay too high a price for any sensation. He was conscious, and the thought brought a gleam of pleasure into his brown agate eyes. But it was through certain words of his, musical words said with musical utterance, that Dorian Gray's soul had turned to this white girl and bowed in worship before her. To a large extent the lad was his own creation. He had made him premature, that was something. Ordinary people waited till life disclosed to them its secrets, but to the few, to the elect, the mysteries of life were revealed before the veil was drawn away. Sometimes this was the effect of art, and chiefly of the art of literature, which dealt immediately with the passions and the intellect. But now and then a complex personality took the place and assumed the office of art, was indeed in its way a real work of art, life having its elaborate masterpieces, just as poetry has, or sculpture, or painting. Yes, the lad was premature. He was gathering his harvest while it was yet spring. The pulse and passion of youth were in him, but he was becoming self-conscious. It was delightful to watch him. With his beautiful face and his beautiful soul, he was a thing to wonder at. It was no matter how it all ended, or was destined to end. He was like one of those gracious figures in a pageant or a play whose joys seem to be remote from one, but whose sorrows stir one's sense of beauty and whose wounds are like red roses. Soul and body, body and soul, how mysterious they were. There was animalism in the soul, and the body had its moments of spirituality. The senses could refine, and the intellect could degrade. Who could say where the fleshly impulse ceased, or the psychical impulse began? How shallow were the arbitrary definitions of ordinary psychologists? And yet how difficult to decide between the claims of the various schools was the soul a shadow seated in the house of sin, or was the body really in the soul, as Giordano Bruno thought? The separation of spirit from matter was a mystery, and the union of spirit with matter was a mystery also. He began to wonder whether we could ever make psychology so absolute a science that each little spring of life would be revealed to us. As it was, we always misunderstood ourselves and rarely understood others. Experience was of no ethical value, it was merely the name men gave to their mistakes. Moralists had, as a rule, regarded it as a mode of warning, 
had claimed for it a certain ethical efficacy in the formation of character, had praised it as something that taught us what to follow and showed us what to avoid. But there was no motive power in experience. It was as little of an active cause as conscience itself. All that it really demonstrated was that our future would be the same as our past, and that the sin we had done once, and with loathing, we would do many times, and with joy. It was clear to him that the experimental method was the only method by which one could arrive at any scientific analysis of the passions, and certainly Dorian Gray was a subject made to his hand and seemed to promise rich and fruitful results. His sudden mad love for Sybil Vane was a psychological phenomenon of no small interest. There was no doubt that curiosity had much to do with it, curiosity and the desire for new experiences, yet it was not a simple but rather a very complex passion. What there was in it of the purely sensuous instinct of boyhood had been transformed by the workings of the imagination, changed into something that seemed to the lad himself to be remote from sense, and was for that very reason all the more dangerous. It was the passions about whose origin we deceived ourselves that tyrannised most strongly over us. Our weakest motives were those of whose nature we were conscious. It often happened that when we thought we were experimenting on others, we were really experimenting on ourselves. While Lord Henry sat dreaming on these things, a knock came to the door, and his valet entered and reminded him it was time to dress for dinner. He got up and looked out into the street. The sunset had smitten into scarlet gold the upper windows of the houses opposite. The panes glowed like plates of heated metal. The sky above was like a faded rose. He thought of his friend's young, fiery-coloured life and wondered how it was all going to end. When he arrived home about half-past twelve o'clock, he saw a telegram lying on the hall table. He opened it and found it was from Dorian Gray. It was to tell him that he was engaged to be married to Sybil Vane. Chapter 5 Mother, mother, I am so happy, whispered the girl, burying her face in the lap of the faded, tired-looking woman who, with back turned to the shrill, intrusive light, was sitting in the one armchair that their dingy sitting room contained. I'm so happy, she repeated, and you must be happy too. Mrs. Vane winced and put her thin, bismuth-whitened hands on her daughter's head. Happy, she echoed. I am only happy, Sybil, when I see you act. You must not think of anything but your acting. Mr. Isaacs has been very good to us, and we owe him money. The girl looked up and pouted. Money, mother? she cried. What does money matter? Love is more than money. Mr. Isaacs has advanced us fifty pounds to pay off our debts and to get a proper outfit for James. You must not forget that, Sybil. Fifty pounds is a very large sum. Mr. Isaacs has been most considerate. He is not a gentleman, mother, and I hate the way he talks to me, said the girl, rising to her feet and going over to the window. I don't know how we could manage without him, answered the elder woman querulously. Sybil Vane tossed her head and laughed. We don't want him any more, mother. Prince Charming rules life for us now. Then she paused. A rose shook in her blood and shadowed her cheeks. A quick breath parted the petals of her lips. They trembled. Some southern wind of passion swept over her and stirred the dainty folds of her dress. I love him, she said simply. Foolish child, foolish child! was the parrot phrase flung in answer. The waving of crooked, false-jeweled fingers gave grotesqueness to the words. The girl laughed again. The joy of a caged bird was in her voice. Her eyes caught the melody and echoed it in radiance, then closed for a moment as though to hide their secret. When they opened, the mist of a dream had passed across them. Thin-lipped wisdom spoke at her from the worn chair, hinted at prudence quoted from that book of cowardice whose author apes the name of common sense. She did not listen. She was free in her prison of passion. Her prince, Prince Charming, was with her. She had called on memory to remake him. She had sent her soul to search for him, and it had brought him back. His kiss burned again upon her mouth. Her eyelids were warm with his breath. Then wisdom altered its method and spoke of espial and discovery. This young man might be rich. If so, marriage should be thought of. 
Against the shell of her ear broke the waves of worldly cunning, the arrows of craft shot by her. She saw the thin lips moving and smiled. Suddenly she felt the need to speak. The wordy silence troubled her. Mother, mother, she cried. Why does he love me so much? I know why I love him. I love him because he is like what love himself should be. But what does he see in me? I am not worthy of him, and yet, why, I cannot tell, though I feel so much beneath him, I don't feel humble. I feel proud, terribly proud. Mother, did you love my father as I love Prince Charming? The elder woman grew pale beneath the coarse powder that daubed her cheeks, and her dry lips twitched with a spasm of pain. Sybil rushed to her, flung her arms round her neck and kissed her. Forgive me, mother. I know it pains you to talk about our father, but it only pains you because you loved him so much. Don't look so sad. I am as happy today as you were twenty years ago. Ah, let me be happy forever. My child, you are far too young to think of falling in love. Besides, what do you know of this young man? You don't even know his name. The whole thing is most inconvenient, and really, when James is going away to Australia, and I have so much to think of, I must say that you should have shown more consideration. However, as I said before, if he is rich... Ah, oh, mother, mother, let me be happy! Mrs Vane glanced at her, and with one of those false theatrical gestures that so often become a mode of second nature to a stage player, clasped her in her arms. At this moment the door opened, and a young lad with rough brown hair came into the room. He was thick set of figure, and his hands and feet were large and somewhat clumsy in movement. He was not so finely bred as his sister. One would hardly have guessed the close relationship that existed between them. Mrs Vane fixed her eyes on him and intensified her smile. She mentally elevated her son to the dignity of an audience. She felt sure that the tableau was interesting. You might keep some of your kisses for me, Sybil, I think, said the lad with a good-natured grumble. Ah, but you don't like being kissed, Jim, she cried. You are a dreadful old bear and she ran across the room and hugged him. James Vane looked into his sister's face with tenderness. I want you to come out with me for a walk, Sybil. I don't suppose I shall ever see this horrid London again. I'm sure I don't want to. My son, don't say such dreadful things, murmured Mrs Vane, taking up a tawdry theatrical dress with a sigh and beginning to patch it. She felt a little disappointed that he had not joined the group. It would have increased the theatrical picturesqueness of the situation. Why not, mother? I mean it. You pain me, my son. I trust you will return from Australia in a position of affluence. I believe there is no society of any kind in the colonies, nothing that I would call society. So when you have made your fortune, you must come back and assert yourself in London. Society, muttered the lad. I don't want to know anything about that. I should like to make some money to take you and Sybil off the stage. I hate it. Oh, Jim said Sybil, laughing. How unkind of you. But are you really going for a walk with me? That will be nice. I was afraid you were going to say goodbye to some of your friends, to Tom Hardy, who gave you that hideous pipe, or Ned Langton, who makes fun of you for smoking it. It is very sweet of you to let me have your last afternoon. Where shall we go? Let us go to the park. I am too shabby, he answered, frowning. Only swell people go to the park. Nonsense, Jim, she whispered stroking the sleeve of his coat. He hesitated for a moment. Very well, he said at last. But don't be too long dressing. She danced out of the door. One could hear her singing as she ran upstairs, her little feet pattered overhead. He walked up and down the room two or three times, then he turned to the still figure in the chair. Mother, are my things ready? he asked. Quite ready, James, she answered, keeping her eyes on her work. For some months past she had felt ill at ease when she was alone with this rough, stern son of hers. Her shallow, secret nature was troubled when their eyes met. She used to wonder if he suspected anything. The silence, for he made no other observation, became intolerable to her. She began to complain. Women defend themselves by attacking just as they attack by sudden and strange surrenders. I hope you will be contented, James, with your seafaring life, she said. You must remember that it is your own choice. You might have entered a solicitor's office. Solicitors are a very respectable class, and in the country often dine with the best families. I hate offices. 
and I hate clerks, he replied. But you are quite right. I have chosen my own life. All I say is, watch over Sybil. Don't let her come to any harm. Mother, you must watch over her. James, you really talk very strangely. Of course I watch over Sybil. I hear a gentleman comes every night to the theatre and goes behind to talk to her. Is that right? What about that? You are speaking about things you don't understand, James. In the profession, we are accustomed to receive a great deal of most gratifying attention. I myself used to receive many bouquets at one time. That was when acting was really understood. As for Sybil, I do not know at present whether her attachment is serious or not. But there is no doubt that the young man in question is a perfect gentleman. He is always most polite to me. Besides, he has the appearance of being rich, and the flowers he sends are lovely. You don't know his name, though, said the lad harshly. No, answered his mother, with a placid expression in her face. He has not yet revealed his real name. I think it is quite romantic of him. He's probably a member of the aristocracy. James Vane bit his lip. Watch over Sybil, mother, he cried. Watch over her. My son, you distress me very much. Sybil is always under my special care. Of course, if this gentleman is wealthy, there is no reason why she should not contract an alliance with him. I trust he is one of the aristocracy. He has all the appearance of it, I must say. It might be a most brilliant marriage for Sybil. They would make a charming couple. His good looks are really quite remarkable. Everybody notices them. The lad muttered something to himself and drummed on the window pane with his coarse fingers. He had just turned round to say something when the door opened and Sybil ran in. How serious you both are, she cried. What is the matter? Nothing, he answered. I suppose one must be serious sometimes. Goodbye, mother. I will have my dinner at five o'clock. Everything is packed except my shirts, so you need not trouble. Goodbye, my son, she answered with a bow of strained stateliness. She was extremely annoyed at the tone he had adopted with her, and there was something in his look that had made her feel afraid. Kiss me, mother, said the girl. Her flower-like lips touched the withered cheek and warmed its frost. My child, my child, cried Mrs. Vane, looking up to the ceiling in search of an imaginary gallery. Come, Sybil, said her brother impatiently. He hated his mother's affectations. They went out into the flickering, wind-blown sunlight and strolled down the dreary Euston Road. The passers-by glanced in wonder at the sullen, heavy youth who, in coarse, ill-fitting clothes, was in the company of such a graceful, refined-looking girl. He was like a common gardener walking with a rose. Jim frowned from time to time when he caught the inquisitive glance of some stranger. He had that dislike of being stared at which comes on geniuses late in life and never leaves the commonplace. Sybil, however, was quite unconscious of the effect she was producing. Her love was trembling in laughter on her lips. She was thinking of Prince Charming, and that she might think of him all the more she did not talk of him, but prattled on about the ship in which Jim was going to sail, about the gold he was certain to find, about the wonderful heiress whose life he was to save from the wicked red-shirted bushrangers. For he was not to remain a sailor, or a supercargo, or whatever he was going to be. Oh, no. A sailor's existence was dreadful. Fancy being cooped up in a horrid ship with the horse humped backed waves trying to get in and a black wind blowing the masts down and tearing the sails into long screaming ribbons. He was to leave the vessel at Melbourne, bid a polite goodbye to the captain and go off at once to the gold fields. Before a week was over, he was to come across a large nugget of pure gold, the largest nugget that had ever been discovered and bring it down to the coast in a wagon guarded by six mounted policemen. The bushrangers were to attack them three times and be defeated with immense slaughter. Or, no, he was not to go to the gold fields at all. They were horrid places, where men got intoxicated and shot each other in bar rooms and used bad language. He was to be a nice sheep farmer, and one evening as he was riding home, he was to see the beautiful heiress being carried off by a robber on a black horse and give chase and rescue her. Of course she would fall in love with him, and he with her, and they would get married and come home and live in an immense house in London. Yes, there were delightful things in store for him, but he must be very good and not lose his temper or spend his money foolishly. She was only a year older than he was, but she knew so much more of life. He must be sure also to write to her by every mail, 
and to say his prayers each night before he went to sleep. God was very good and would watch over him. She would pray for him too, and in a few years he would come back quite rich and happy. The lad listened sulkily to her and made no answer. He was heartsick at leaving home. Yet it was not this alone that made him gloomy and morose. Inexperienced though he was, he had still a strong sense of the danger of Sybil's position. This young dandy who was making love to her could mean her no good. He was a gentleman, and he hated him for that. Hated him through some curious race instinct for which he could not account, and which for that reason was all the more dominant within him. He was conscious also of the shallowness and vanity of his mother's nature, and in that saw infinite peril for Sybil and Sybil's happiness. Children begin by loving their parents. As they grow older, they judge them. Sometimes they forgive them. His mother. He had something on his mind to ask of her, something that he had brooded on for many months of silence. A chance phrase that he had heard at the theatre, a whispered sneer that had reached his ears one night as he waited at the stage door, had set loose a train of horrible thoughts. He remembered it as if it had been the lash of a hunting crop across his face. His brows knit together into a wedge-like furrow, and with a twitch of pain, he bit his underlip. You are not listening to a word I am saying, Jim, cried Sybil, and I am making the most delightful plans for your future. Do say something. What do you want me to say? Oh, that you will be a good boy and not forget us, she answered, smiling at him. He shrugged his shoulders. You are more likely to forget me than I am to forget you, Sybil. She flushed. What do you mean, Jim? she asked. You have a new friend, I hear. Who is he? Why have you not told me about him? He means you no good. Stop, Jim, she exclaimed. You must not say anything against him. I love him. Why, you don't even know his name, answered the lad. Who is he? I have a right to know. He is called Prince Charming. Don't you like the name? Oh, you silly boy, you should never forget it. If you only saw him, you would think him the most wonderful person in the world. Some day you will meet him, when you come back from Australia. You will like him so much, everybody likes him, and I love him. I wish you could come to the theatre tonight. He's going to be there, and I'm to play Juliet. Oh, how I shall play it. Fancy, Jim, to be in love and play Juliet. To have him sitting there, to play for his delight. I am afraid I may frighten the company, frighten or enthrall them. To be in love is to surpass oneself. Poor dreadful Mr Isaacs will be shouting genius to his loafers at the bar. He has preached me as a dogma. Tonight he will announce me as a revelation. I feel it. And it is all his, his only, Prince Charming, my wonderful lover, my god of graces. But I am poor beside him. Poor? What does that matter? When poverty creeps in at the door, love flies in through the window. Our proverbs want rewriting. They were made in winter and it is summer now. Springtime for me, I think. A very dance of blossoms in blue skies. He is a gentleman, said the lad sullenly. A prince, she cried musically. What more do you want? He wants to enslave you. I shudder at the thought of being free. I want you to beware of him. To see him is to worship him, to know him is to trust him. Sybil, you are mad about him. She laughed and took his arm. You dear old Jim, you talk as if you were a hundred. Some day you will be in love yourself. Then you will know what it is. Don't look so sulky. Surely you should be glad to think that, though you are going away, you leave me happier than I have ever been before. Life has been hard for us both, terribly hard and difficult. But it will be different now. You are going to a new world, and I have found one. Here are two chairs. Let us sit down and see the smart people go by. They took their seats amidst a crowd of watchers. The tulip beds across the road flamed like throbbing rings of fire. A white dust, tremulous cloud of oris root, it seemed, hung in the panting air. The brightly coloured parasols danced and dipped like monstrous butterflies. She made her brother talk of himself, his hopes, his prospects. He spoke slowly and with effort. They passed words to each other as players at a game pass counters. Sybil felt oppressed. She could not communicate her joy. A faint smile curving that sullen mouth was all the echo she could win. After some time she became silent. Suddenly she caught a glimpse of golden hair and laughing lips, and in an open carriage with two ladies, Dorian Gray drove past. 
she started to her feet. There he is, she cried. Who? said Jim Bain. Prince Charming, she answered, looking after the Victoria. He jumped up and seized her roughly by the arm. Show him to me. Which is he? Point him out. I must see him, he exclaimed. But at that moment the Duke of Berwick's four in hand came between, and when it had left the space clear, the carriage had swept out of the park. He is gone, murmured Sybil sadly. I wish you had seen him. I wish I had, for as sure as there is a god in heaven, if he ever does you any wrong, I shall kill him. She looked at him in horror. He repeated his words. They cut the air like a dagger. The people round began to gape. A lady standing close to her tittered. Come away, Jim, come away, she whispered. He followed her doggedly as she passed through the crowd. He felt glad at what he had said. When they reached the Achilles statue, she turned round. There was pity in her eyes that became laughter on her lips. She shook her head at him. You are foolish, Jim, utterly foolish. A bad-tempered boy, that is all. How can you say such horrible things? You don't know what you are talking about. You are simply jealous and unkind. Ah, I wish you would fall in love. Love makes people good, and what you said was wicked. I am sixteen, he answered, and I know what I am about. Mother is no help to you. She doesn't understand how to look after you. I wish now that I was not going to Australia at all. I have a great mind to chuck the whole thing up. I would, if my articles hadn't been signed. Oh, don't be so serious, Jim. You are like one of the heroes of those silly melodramas Mother used to be so fond of acting in. I am not going to quarrel with you. I have seen him, and oh, to see him is perfect happiness. We won't quarrel. I know you would never harm anyone I love, would you? Not as long as you love him, I suppose, was the sullen answer. I shall love him forever, she cried. And he? Forever too. He had better. She shrank from him. Then she laughed and put her hand on his arm. He was merely a boy. At the Marble Arch they hailed an omnibus, which left them close to their shabby home in the Euston Road. It was after five o'clock, and Sybil had to lie down for a couple of hours before acting. Jim insisted that she should do so. He said that he would sooner part with her when their mother was not present. She would be sure to make a scene, and he detested scenes of every kind. In Sybil's own room they parted. There was jealousy in the lad's heart, and a fierce, murderous hatred of the stranger who, as it seemed to him, had come between them. Yet when her arms were flung round his neck, and her fingers strayed through his hair, he softened and kissed her with real affection. There were tears in his eyes as he went downstairs. His mother was waiting for him below. She grumbled at his unpunctuality as he entered. He made no answer, but sat down to his meagre meal. The flies buzzed round the table and crawled over the stained cloth. Through the rumble of omnibuses and the clatter of street cabs, he could hear the droning voice devouring each minute that was left to him. After some time, he thrust away his plate and put his head in his hands. He felt that he had a right to know. It should have been told to him before, if it was as he suspected. Leaden with fear, his mother watched him. Words dropped mechanically from her lips. A tattered lace handkerchief twitched in her fingers. When the clock struck six, he got up and went to the door. Then he turned back and looked at her. Their eyes met. In hers, he saw a wild appeal for mercy. It enraged him. Mother, I have something to ask you, he said. Her eyes wandered vaguely about the room. She made no answer. Tell me the truth. I have a right to know. Were you married to my father? She heaved a deep sigh. It was a sigh of relief. The terrible moment, the moment that night and day for weeks and months she had dreaded, had come at last, and yet she felt no terror. Indeed, in some measure it was a disappointment to her. The vulgar directness of the question called for a direct answer. The situation had not been gradually led up to. It was crude. It reminded her of a bad rehearsal. No, she answered wondering at the harsh simplicity of life. My father was a scoundrel then, cried the lad, clenching his fists. She shook her head. I knew he was not free. We loved each other very much. If he had lived, he would have made provision for us. Don't speak against him, my son. He was your father and a gentleman. Indeed, he was highly connected. 
an oath broke from his lips. I don't care for myself, he exclaimed, but don't let Sybil. It is a gentleman, isn't it, who is in love with her, or says he is. Highly connected too, I suppose. For a moment a hideous sense of humiliation came over the woman. Her head drooped. She wiped her eyes with shaking hands. Sybil has a mother, she murmured. I had none. The lad was touched. He went towards her and stooping down he kissed her. I am sorry if I have pained you by asking about my father, he said, but I could not help it. I must go now. Goodbye. Don't forget that you will have only one child now to look after, and believe me that if this man wrongs my sister, I will find out who he is, track him down, and kill him like a dog. I swear it. The exaggerated folly of the threat, the passionate gesture that accompanied it, the mad melodramatic words made life seem more vivid to her. She was familiar with the atmosphere. She breathed more freely, and for the first time for many months, she really admired her son. She would have liked to have continued the scene on the same emotional scale, but he cut her short. Trunks had to be carried down and mufflers looked for. The lodging house drudge bustled in and out. There was the bargaining with the cabman. The moment was lost in vulgar details. It was with a renewed feeling of disappointment that she waved the tattered lace handkerchief from the window as her son drove away. She was conscious that a great opportunity had been wasted. She consoled herself by telling Sybil how desolate she felt her life would be now that she had only one child to look after. She remembered the phrase. It had pleased her. Of the threat, she said nothing. It was vividly and dramatically expressed. She felt that they would all laugh at it some day. Chapter 6 I suppose you've heard the news, Basil, said Lord Henry that evening as Hallwood was shown into a little private room at the Bristol, where dinner had been laid for three. No, Harry, answered the artist, giving his hat and coat to the bowing waiter. What is it? Nothing about politics, I hope. They don't interest me. There is hardly a single person in the House of Commons worth painting, though many of them would be the better for a little whitewashing. Dorian Gray is engaged to be married, said Lord Henry, watching him as he spoke. Hallward started and then frowned. Dorian engaged to be married, he cried. Impossible. It is perfectly true. To whom? To some little actress or other. I can't believe it. Dorian is far too sensible. Dorian is far too wise not to do foolish things now and then, my dear Basil. Marriage is hardly a thing that one can do now and then, Harry. Except in America, rejoined Lord Henry languidly. But I didn't say he was married. I said he was engaged to be married. There is a great difference. I have a distinct remembrance of being married, but I have no recollection at all of being engaged. I am inclined to think that I was never engaged. But think of Dorian's birth and position and wealth. It would be absurd for him to marry so much beneath him. If you want to make him marry this girl, tell him that, Basil. He is sure to do it then. Whenever a man does a thoroughly stupid thing, it is always from the noblest motives. I hope the girl is good, Harry. I don't want to see Dorian tied to some vile creature who might degrade his nature and ruin his intellect. Oh, she is better than good. She is beautiful, murmured Lord Henry, sipping a glass of vermouth and orange bitters. Dorian says she is beautiful, and he is not often wrong about things of that kind. Your portrait of him has quickened his appreciation of the personal appearance of other people. It has had that excellent effect amongst others. We are to see her tonight, if that boy doesn't forget his appointment. Are you serious? Quite serious, Basil. I should be miserable if I thought I should ever be more serious than I am at the present moment. But do you approve of it, Harry? asked the painter, walking up and down the room and biting his lip. You can't approve of it, possibly. It is some silly infatuation. I never approve or disapprove of anything now. It is an absurd attitude to take towards life. We are not sent into the world to air our moral prejudices. I never take any notice of what common people say, and I never interfere with what charming people do. If a personality fascinates me, whatever mode of expression that personality selects is absolutely delightful to me. 
Dorian Gray falls in love with a beautiful girl who acts Juliet and proposes to marry her. Why not? If he wedded Messalina, he would be none the less interesting. You know I am not a champion of marriage. The real drawback to marriage is that it makes one unselfish, and unselfish people are colourless. They lack individuality. Still, there are certain temperaments that marriage makes more complex. They retain their egotism and add to it many other egos. They are forced to have more than one life. They become more highly organised. And to be highly organised is, I should fancy, the object of man's existence. Besides, every experience is of value. And whatever one may say against marriage, it is certainly an experience. I hope that Dorian Gray will make this girl his wife, passionately adore her for six months, and then suddenly become fascinated by someone else. He would be a wonderful study. You don't mean a single word of all that, Harry. You know you don't. If Dorian Gray's life was spoiled, no one would be sorrier than yourself. You are much better than you pretend to be. Lord Henry laughed. The reason we all like to think so well of others is that we are all afraid for ourselves. The basis of optimism is sheer terror. We think that we are generous because we credit our neighbour with the possession of those virtues that are likely to be a benefit to us. We praise the banker that we may overdraw our account and find good qualities in the highwayman in the hope that he may spare our pockets. I mean everything that I have said. I have the greatest contempt for optimism. As for a spoiled life, no life is spoiled but one whose growth is arrested. If you want to mar a nature, you have merely to reform it. As for marriage, of course that would be silly. But there are other and more interesting bonds between men and women. I will certainly encourage them. They have the charm of being fashionable. But here is Dorian himself. He will tell you more than I can. My dear Harry, my dear Basil, you must both congratulate me, said the lad throwing off his evening cape with its satin-lined wings and shaking each of his friends by the hand in turn. I have never been so happy. Of course it is sudden, all really delightful things are, and yet it seems to me to be the one thing I have been looking for all my life. He was flushed with excitement and pleasure and looked extraordinarily handsome. I hope you will always be very happy, Dorian, said Hallward, but I don't quite forgive you for not having let me know of your engagement. You let Harry know. And I don't forgive you for being late for dinner, broke in Lord Henry, putting his hand on the lad's shoulder and smiling as he spoke. Come, let us sit down and try what the new chef here is like, and then you will tell us how it all came about. There is really not much to tell, cried Dorian, as they took their seats at the small round table. What happened was simply this. After I left you yesterday evening, Harry, I dressed had some dinner at that little Italian restaurant in Rupert Street you introduced me to, and went down at eight o'clock to the theatre. Sybil was playing Rosalind. Of course, the scenery was dreadful and the Orlando absurd, but Sybil, you should have seen her. When she came on in her boy's clothes, she was perfectly wonderful. She wore a moss-coloured velvet jerkin with cinnamon sleeves, slim brown cross-gartered hose, a dainty little green cap with a hawk's feather caught in a jewel, and a hooded cloak lined with dull red. She had never seemed to me more exquisite. She had all the delicate grace of that Tanagra figurine you have in your studio, Basil. Her hair clustered round her face like dark leaves round a pale rose. As for her acting, well, you shall see her tonight. She is simply a born artist. I sat in the dingy box, absolutely enthralled. I forgot that I was in London and in the 19th century. I was away with my love in a forest that no man had ever seen. After the performance was over, I went behind and spoke to her. As we were sitting together, suddenly there came into her eyes a look that I had never seen there before. My lips moved towards hers. We kissed each other. I can't describe to you what I felt at that moment. It seemed to me that all my life had been narrowed to one perfect point of rose-coloured joy. She trembled all over and shook like a white narcissus. Then she flung herself on her knees and kissed my hands, I feel that I should not tell you all this, but I can't help it. Of course, our engagement is a dead secret. She has not even told her own mother. I don't know what my guardians will say. Lord Radley is sure to be furious. I don't care. I shall be of age in less than a year, and then I can do what I like. I have been right, Basil, haven't I? To take my love out of poetry and to find my wife in Shakespeare's plays. Lips that Shakespeare taught to speak have whispered their secret in my ear. 
I have had the arms of Rosalind around me and kissed Juliet on the mouth. Yes, Dorian, I suppose you were right, said Hallward, slowly. Have you seen her today? asked Lord Henry. Dorian Gray shook his head. I left her in the forest of Arden. I shall find her in an orchard in Verona. Lord Henry sipped his champagne in a meditative manner. At what particular point did you mention the word marriage, Dorian? And what did she say in answer? Perhaps you forgot all about it. My dear Harry, I did not treat it as a business transaction, and I did not make any formal proposal. I told her that I loved her, and she said she was not worthy to be my wife. Not worthy. Why, the whole world is nothing to me compared with her. Women are wonderfully practical, murmured Lord Henry. Much more practical than we are. In situations of that kind, we often forget to say anything about marriage, and they always remind us. Hallward laid his hand upon his arm. Don't, Harry. You have annoyed Dorian. He is not like other men. He would never bring misery upon anyone. His nature is too fine for that. Lord Henry looked across the table. Dorian is never annoyed with me, he answered. I ask the question for the best reason possible, for the only reason, indeed, that excuses one for asking any question. Simple curiosity. I have a theory that it is always the women who propose to us, and not we who propose to the women, except, of course, in middle-class life, but then the middle classes are not modern. Dorian Gray laughed and tossed his head. You are quite incorrigible, Harry, but I don't mind. It is impossible to be angry with you. When you see Sybil Vane, you will feel that the man who could wrong her would be a beast, a beast without a heart. I cannot understand how anyone can wish to shame the thing he loves. I love Sybil Vane. I want to place her on a pedestal of gold and to see the world worship the woman who is mine. What is marriage? An irrevocable vow. You mock at it for that. Ah, don't mock. It is an irrevocable vow that I want to take. Her trust makes me faithful. Her belief makes me good. When I am with her, I regret all that you have taught me. I become different from what you have known me to be. I am changed, and the mere touch of Sybil Vane's hand makes me forget you and all your wrong, fascinating, poisonous, delightful theories. And those are? asked Lord Henry, helping himself to some salad. Oh, your theories about life, your theories about love, your theories about pleasure, all your theories, in fact, Harry. Pleasure is the only thing worth having a theory about, he answered in his slow, melodious voice. But I am afraid I cannot claim my theory as my own. It belongs to nature, not to me. Pleasure is nature's test, her sign of approval. When we are happy, we are always good. But when we are good, we are not always happy. Ah, but what do you mean by good? cried Basil Hallward. Yes, echoed Dorian, leaning back in his chair and looking at Lord Henry over the heavy clusters of purple-lipped irises that stood in the centre of the table. What do you mean by good, Harry? To be good is to be in harmony with oneself, he replied, touching the thin stem of his glass with his pale, fine-pointed fingers. Discord is to be forced to be in harmony with others. One's own life, that is the important thing. As for the lives of one's neighbours, if one wishes to be a prig or a puritan, one can flaunt one's moral views about them, but they are not one's concern. Besides, individualism has really the higher aim. Modern morality consists in accepting the standard of one's age. I consider that for any man of culture to accept the standard of his age is a form of the grossest immorality. But surely, if one lives merely for oneself, Harry, one pays a terrible price for doing so, suggested the painter. Yes, we are overcharged for everything nowadays. I should fancy that the real tragedy of the poor is that they can afford nothing but self-denial. Beautiful sins, like beautiful things, are the privilege of the rich. One has to pay in other ways but money. What sort of ways, Basil? Oh, I should fancy in remorse, in suffering, in... Well, in the consciousness of degradation. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. My dear fellow... Medieval art is charming, but medieval emotions are out of date. One can use them in fiction, of course, but then the only things that one can use in fiction are the things that one has ceased to use in fact. Believe me, no civilised man ever regrets a pleasure, and no uncivilised man ever knows what a pleasure is. 
I know what a pleasure is, cried Dorian Gray. It is to adore someone. That is certainly better than being adored, he answered, toying with some fruits. Being adored is a nuisance. Women treat us just as humanity treats its gods. They worship us and are always bothering us to do something for them. I should have said that whatever they ask for, they had first given to us, murmured the lad gravely. They create love in our natures. They have a right to demand it back. That is quite true, Dorian, cried Horwood. Nothing is ever quite true, said Lord Henry. This is, interrupted Dorian. You must admit, Harry, that women give to men the very gold of their lives. Possibly, he sighed. But they invariably want it back in such very small change. That is the worry. Women, as some witty Frenchman once put it, inspire us with the desire to do masterpieces and always prevent us from carrying them out. Harry, you are dreadful. I don't know why I like you so much. You will always like me, Dorian, he replied. Will you have some coffee, you fellows? Waiter, bring coffee and fine champagne and some cigarettes. No, don't mind the cigarettes, I have some. Basil, I can't allow you to smoke cigars. You must have a cigarette. A cigarette is the perfect type of a perfect pleasure. It is exquisite, and it leaves one unsatisfied. What more can one want? Yes, Dorian, you will always be fond of me. I represent to you all the sins you have never had the courage to commit. What nonsense you talk, Harry, cried the lad, taking a light from a fire-breathing silver dragon that the waiter had placed on the table. Let us go down to the theatre. When Sybil comes on the stage, you will have a new ideal of life. She will represent something to you that you have never known. I have known everything, said Lord Henry, with a tired look in his eyes, but I am always ready for a new emotion. I am afraid, however, that, for me at any rate, there is no such thing. Still, your wonderful girl may thrill me. I love acting. It is so much more real than life. Let us go. Dorian, you will come with me. I am so sorry, Basil, but there is only room for two in the brougham. You must follow us in the hansom. They got up and put on their coats, sipping their coffee standing. The painter was silent and preoccupied. There was a gloom over him. He could not bear this marriage, and yet it seemed to him to be better than many other things that might have happened. After a few minutes they all passed downstairs. He drove off by himself, as had been arranged, and watched the flashing lights of the little brougham in front of him. A strange sense of loss came over him. He felt that Dorian Gray would never again be to him all that he had been in the past. Life had come between them. His eyes darkened and the crowded, flaring streets became blurred to his eyes. When the cab drew up at the theatre, it seemed to him that he had grown years older. Chapter 7 For some reason or other, the house was crowded that night, and the fat Jew manager who met them at the door was beaming from ear to ear with an oily, tremulous smile. He escorted them to their box with a sort of pompous humility, waving his fat, jewelled hands and talking at the top of his voice. Dorian Gray loathed him more than ever. He felt as if he had come to look for Miranda and had been met by Caliban. Lord Henry, upon the other hand, rather liked him. At least he declared he did, and insisted on shaking him by the hand and assuring him that he was proud to meet a man who had discovered a real genius and gone bankrupt over a poet. Hallward amused himself with watching the faces in the pit. The heat was terribly oppressive, and the huge sunlight flamed like a monstrous dahlia with petals of yellow fire. The youths in the gallery had taken off their coats and waistcoats and hung them over the side. They talked to each other across the theatre and shared their oranges with the tawdry girls who sat beside them. Some women were laughing in the pit. Their voices were horribly shrill and discordant. The sound of the popping of corks came from the bar. What a place to find one's divinity in, said Lord Henry. Yes, answered Dorian Gray. It was here I found her, and she is divine beyond all living things. When she acts, you will forget everything. These common rough people with their coarse faces and brutal gestures become quite different when she is on the stage. They sit silently and watch her. They weep and laugh as she wills them to do. She makes them as responsive as a violin. She spiritualizes them, and one feels that they are of the same flesh and blood as oneself. The same flesh and blood as oneself? Oh, I hope not, 
exclaimed Lord Henry, who was scanning the occupants of the gallery through his opera glass. Don't pay any attention to him, Dorian, said the painter. I understand what you mean, and I believe in this girl. Anyone you love must be marvellous, and any girl that has the effect you describe must be fine and noble. To spiritualise one's age, that is something worth doing. If this girl can give a soul to those who have lived without one, if she can create the sense of beauty in people whose lives have been sordid and ugly, if she can strip them of their selfishness and lend them tears for sorrows that are not their own, she is worthy of all your adoration, worthy of the adoration of the world. This marriage is quite right. I did not think so at first, but I admit it now. The gods made Sybil Vane for you. Without her, you would have been incomplete. Thanks, Basil answered Dorian Gray, pressing his hand. I knew that you would understand me. Harry is so cynical, he terrifies me. But here is the orchestra. It is quite dreadful, but it only lasts for about five minutes. Then the curtain rises, and you will see the girl to whom I am going to give all my life, to whom I have given everything that is good in me. A quarter of an hour afterwards, amidst an extraordinary turmoil of applause, Sybil Vane stepped onto the stage. Yes, she was certainly lovely to look at, one of the loveliest creatures, Lord Henry thought, that he had ever seen. There was something of the fawn in her shy grace and startled eyes. A faint blush like the shadow of a rose in a mirror of silver came to her cheeks as she glanced at the crowded, enthusiastic house. She stepped back a few paces, and her lips seemed to tremble. Basil Hallward leapt to his feet and began to applaud. Motionless as one in a dream, sat Dorian Gray, gazing at her. Lord Henry peered through his glasses, murmuring, Charming, charming. The scene was the hall of Capulet's house, and Romeo in his pilgrim's dress had entered with Mercutio and his other friends. The band, such as it was, struck up a few bars of music, and the dance began. Through the crowd of ungainly, shabbily dressed actors, Sybil Vane moved like a creature from a finer world. Her body swayed while she danced, as a plant sways in the water. The curves of her throat were the curves of a white lily. Her hands seemed to be made of cool ivory. Yet she was curiously listless. She showed no sign of joy when her eyes rested on Romeo. The few words she had to speak. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. With the brief dialogue that follows, was spoken in a thoroughly artificial manner. The voice was exquisite, but from the point of view of tone it was absolutely false. It was wrong in colour. It took away all the life from the verse. It made the passion unreal. Dorian Gray grew pale as he watched her. He was puzzled and anxious. Neither of his friends dared to say anything to him. She seemed to them to be absolutely incompetent. They were horribly disappointed. Yet they felt that the true test of any Juliet is the balcony scene of the second act. They waited for that. If she failed there, there was nothing in her. She looked charming as she came out in the moonlight. That could not be denied. But the staginess of her acting was unbearable and grew worse as she went on. Her gestures became absurdly artificial. She overemphasized everything that she had to say. The beautiful passage. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would a maiden blush bepaint my cheek, for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight was declaimed with the painful precision of a schoolgirl who has been taught to recite by some second-rate professor of elocution. When she leaned over the balcony and came to those wonderful lines, Although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning which doth cease to be, ere one can say, It lightens. Sweet good night, this bud of love by summer's ripening breath may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. She spoke the words as though they conveyed no meaning to her. It was not nervousness. Indeed, so far from being nervous, she was absolutely self-contained. It was simply bad art. She was a complete failure. Even the common, uneducated audience of the pit and gallery lost their interest in the play. They got restless and began to talk loudly and to whistle. The Jew manager who was standing at the back of the dress circle stamped and swore with rage. The only person unmoved was the girl herself. When the second act was over, there came a storm of hisses, 
and Lord Henry got up from his chair and put on his coat. She is quite beautiful, Dorian, he said, but she can't act. Let us go. I am going to see the play through, answered the lad in a hard, bitter voice. I am awfully sorry that I have made you waste an evening, Harry. I apologise to you both. My dear Dorian, I should think Miss Vane was ill, interrupted Hallward. We will come some other night. I wish you were ill, he rejoined, but she seems to me to be simply callous and cold. She has entirely altered. Last night she was a great artist. This evening she is merely a commonplace, mediocre actress. Don't talk like that about anyone you love, Dorian. Love is a more wonderful thing than art. They are both simply forms of imitation, remarked Lord Henry. But do let us go. Dorian, you must not stay here any longer. It is not good for one's morals to see bad acting. Besides, I don't suppose you will want your wife to act, so what does it matter if she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She is very lovely, and if she knows as little about life as she does about acting, she will be a delightful experience. There are only two kinds of people who are really fascinating. People who know absolutely everything and people who know absolutely nothing. Good heavens, my dear boy, don't look so tragic. The secret of remaining young is never to have an emotion that is unbecoming. Come to the club with Basil and myself. We will smoke cigarettes and drink to the beauty of Sybil Vane. She is beautiful. What more can you want? Go away, Harry, cried the lad. I want to be alone. Basil, you must go. Ah, oh, can't you see that my heart is breaking? The hot tears came to his eyes, his lips trembled, and rushing to the back of the box, he leaned up against the wall, hiding his face in his hands. Let us go, Basil, said Lord Henry, with a strange tenderness in his voice, and the two young men passed out together. A few moments afterwards, the footlights flared up, and the curtain rose on the third act. Dorian Gray went back to his seat. He looked pale and proud and indifferent. The play dragged on and seemed interminable. Half of the audience went out, tramping in heavy boots and laughing. The whole thing was a fiasco. The last act was played to almost empty benches. The curtain went down on a titter and some groans. As soon as it was over, Dorian Gray rushed behind the scenes into the green room. The girl was standing there alone, with a look of triumph on her face. Her eyes were lit with an exquisite fire. There was a radiance about her. Her parted lips were smiling over some secret of their own. When he entered, she looked at him, and an expression of infinite joy came over her. How badly I acted tonight, Dorian, she cried. Horribly, he answered, gazing at her in amazement. Horribly, it was dreadful. Are you ill? You have no idea what it was. You have no idea what I suffered. The girl smiled. Dorian, she answered lingering over his name with long-drawn music in her voice, as though it were sweeter than honey to the red petals of her mouth. Dorian, you should have understood, but you understand now, don't you? Understand what? he asked angrily. Why I was so bad tonight? Why I shall always be bad? Why I shall never act well again? He shrugged his shoulders. You are ill, I suppose. When you are ill, you shouldn't act. You make yourself ridiculous. My friends are bored. I was bored. She seemed not to listen to him. She was transfigured with joy. An ecstasy of happiness dominated her. Dorian, Dorian, she cried. Before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. It was only in the theatre that I lived. I thought that it was all true. I was Rosalind one night and Portia the other. The joy of Beatrice was my joy and the sorrows of Cordelia were mine also. I believed in everything. The common people who acted with me seemed to me to be godlike. The painted scenes were my world. I knew nothing but shadows, and I thought them real. You came, oh, my beautiful love, and you freed my soul from prison. You taught me what reality really is. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I saw through the hollowness, the sham, the silliness of the empty pageant in which I had always played. Tonight, for the first time, I became conscious that the Romeo was hideous and old and painted, that the moonlight in the orchard was false, that the scenery was vulgar, and that the words I had to speak were unreal, were not my words, were not what I wanted to say. You had brought me something higher, 
something of which all art is but a reflection. You had made me understand what love really is. My love, my love, prince, charming, prince of life. I have grown sick of shadows. You are more to me than all art can ever be. What have I to do with the puppets of a play? When I came on tonight, I could not understand how it was that everything had gone from me. I thought that I was going to be wonderful. I found that I could do nothing. Suddenly it dawned on my soul what it all meant. The knowledge was exquisite to me. I heard them hissing and I smiled. What could they know of love such as ours? Take me away, Dorian. Take me away with you where we can be quite alone. I hate the stage. I might mimic a passion that I do not feel, but I cannot mimic one that burns me like fire. Oh, Dorian, Dorian, you understand now what it signifies. Even if I could do it, it would be profanation for me to play at being in love. You have made me see that. He flung himself down on the sofa and turned away his face. You have killed my love, he muttered. She looked at him in wonder and laughed. He made no answer. She came across to him and with her little fingers stroked his hair. She knelt down and pressed his hands to her lips. He drew them away and a shudder ran through him. Then he leapt up and went to the door. Yes, he cried, you have killed my love. You used to stir my imagination. Now you don't even stir my curiosity. You simply produce no effect. I loved you because you were marvellous, because you had genius and intellect, because you realised the dreams of great poets and gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. You have thrown it all away. You are shallow and stupid. My God, how mad I was to love you. What a fool I have been. You are nothing to me now. I will never see you again. I will never think of you. I will never mention your name. You don't know what you were to me once. Why once? Oh, I can't bear to think of it. I wish I had never laid eyes upon you. You have spoiled the romance of my life. How little you can know of love if you say it mars your art. Without your art, you are nothing. I would have made you famous, splendid, magnificent. The world would have worshipped you, and you would have borne my name. What are you now? A third-rate actress with a pretty face. The girl grew white and trembled. She clenched her hands together, and her voice seemed to catch in her throat. You are not serious, Dorian, she murmured. You are acting. Acting? I leave that to you. You do it so well, he answered bitterly. She rose from her knees and with a piteous expression of pain in her face came across the room to him. She put her hand upon his arm and looked into his eyes. He thrust her back. Don't touch me, he cried. A low moan broke from her and she flung herself at his feet and lay there like a trampled flower. Dorian, Dorian, don't leave me, she whispered. I am so sorry I didn't act well. I was thinking of you all the time, but I will try, indeed, I will try. It came so suddenly across me, my love for you. I think I should never have known it if you had not kissed me, if we had not kissed each other. Kiss me again, my love. Don't go away from me, I couldn't bear it. Oh, don't go away from me, my brother... No, never mind, he didn't mean it. He was in jest, but you... Oh, can't you forgive me for tonight? I will work so hard to try to improve. Don't be cruel to me because I love you better than anything in the world. After all, it is only once that I have not pleased you. But you are quite right, Dorian. I should have shown myself more of an artist. It was foolish of me, and yet I couldn't help it. Oh, don't leave me, don't leave me! A fit of passionate sobbing choked her. She crouched on the floor like a wounded thing, and Dorian Gray with his beautiful eyes, looked down at her, and his chiselled lips curled in exquisite disdain. There is always something ridiculous about the emotions of people whom one has ceased to love. Sybil Vane seemed to him to be absurdly melodramatic. Her tears and sobs annoyed him. I'm going, he said at last, in his calm, clear voice. I don't wish to be unkind, but I can't see you again. You have disappointed me. She wept silently and made no answer, but crept nearer. Her little hand stretched blindly out and appeared to be seeking for him. He turned on his heel and left the room. In a few moments he was out of the theatre. Where he went to he hardly knew. He remembered wandering through dimly lit streets, 
past gaunt, black-shadowed archways and evil-looking houses. Women with hoarse voices and harsh laughter had called after him. Drunkards had reeled by, cursing and chattering to themselves like monstrous apes. He had seen grotesque children huddled upon doorsteps and heard shrieks and oaths from gloomy courts. As the dawn was just breaking, he found himself close to Covent Garden. The darkness lifted, and flushed with faint fires, the sky hollowed itself into a perfect pearl. Huge carts filled with nodding lilies rumbled slowly down the polished empty street. The air was heavy with the perfume of the flowers, and their beauty seemed to bring him an anodyne for his pain. He followed into the market and watched the men unloading their wagons. A white-smocked carter offered him some cherries. He thanked him, wondered why he refused to accept any money for them, and began to eat them listlessly. They had been plucked at midnight, and the coldness of the moon had entered into them. A long, thin line of boys carrying crates of striped tulips and of yellow and red roses defiled in front of him, threading their way through the huge jade-green piles of vegetables. Under the portico, with its grey, sun-bleached pillars, loitered a troop of draggled, bareheaded girls, waiting for the auction to be over. Others crowded round the swinging doors of the coffee house in the piazza. The heavy cart horses slipped and stamped upon the rough stones, shaking their bells and trappings. Some of the drivers were lying asleep on a pile of sacks. Iris-necked and pink-footed, the pigeons ran about picking up seeds. After a little while, he hailed a hansom and drove home. For a few moments he loitered upon the doorstep, looking round at the silent square with its blank, close-shuttered windows and its staring blinds. The sky was pure opal now, and the roofs of the houses glistened like silver against it. From some chimney opposite, a thin wreath of smoke was rising. It curled a violet ribbon through the nacre-coloured air. In the huge gilt Venetian lantern, spoil of some doge's barge that hung from the ceiling of the great oak-panelled hall of entrance, lights were still burning from three flickering jets. Thin blue petals of flame, they seemed, rimmed with white fire. He turned them out, and having thrown his hat and cape on the table, passed through the library towards the door of his bedroom, a large octagonal chamber on the ground floor that in his newborn feeling for luxury he had just had decorated for himself and hung with some curious Renaissance tapestries that had been discovered stored in a disused attic at Selby Royal. As he was turning the handle of the door, his eye fell upon the portrait Basil Hallward had painted of him. He started back as if in surprise. Then he went on into his own room, looking somewhat puzzled. After he had taken the buttonhole out of his coat, he seemed to hesitate. Finally, he came back, went over to the picture and examined it. In the dim, arrested light that struggled through the cream-coloured silk blinds, the face appeared to him to be a little changed. The expression looked different. One would have said that there was a touch of cruelty in the mouth. It was certainly strange. He turned round and, walking to the window, drew up the blind. The bright dawn flooded the room, and swept the fantastic shadows into dusky corners where they lay shuddering. But the strange expression that he had noticed in the face of the portrait seemed to linger there, to be more intensified even. The quivering, ardent sunlight showed him the lines of cruelty round the mouth as clearly as if he had been looking into a mirror after he had done some dreadful thing. He winced, and taking up from the table an oval glass framed in ivory cupids, one of Lord Henry's many presents to him, glanced hurriedly into its polished depths. No line like that warped his red lips. What did it mean? He rubbed his eyes and came close to the picture and examined it again. There were no signs of any change when he looked into the actual painting, and yet there was no doubt that the whole expression had altered. It was not a mere fancy of his own. The thing was horribly apparent. He threw himself into a chair and began to think. Suddenly there flashed across his mind what he had said in Basil Hallward's studio the day the picture had been finished. Yes, he remembered it perfectly. He had uttered a mad wish that he himself might remain young and the portrait grow old, that his own beauty might be untarnished and the face on the canvas bear the burden of his passions and his sins that the painted image might be seared with the lines of suffering and thought, 
that he might keep all the delicate bloom and loveliness of his then just conscious boyhood. Surely his wish had not been fulfilled. Such things were impossible. It seemed monstrous even to think of them, and yet there was the picture before him with the touch of cruelty in the mouth. Cruelty. Had he been cruel? It was the girl's fault, not his. He had dreamed of her as a great artist, had given his love to her because he had thought her great. Then she had disappointed him. She had been shallow and unworthy. And yet, a feeling of infinite regret came over him as he thought of her lying at his feet, sobbing like a little child. He remembered with what callousness he had watched her. Why had he been made like that? Why had such a soul been given to him? But he had suffered also. During the three terrible hours that the play had lasted, he had lived centuries of pain, eon upon eon of torture. His life was well worth hers. She had marred him for a moment if he had wounded her for an age. Besides, women were better suited to bear sorrow than men. They lived on their emotions. They only thought of their emotions. When they took lovers, it was merely to have someone with whom they could have scenes. Lord Henry had told him that, and Lord Henry knew what women were. Why should he trouble about Sybil Vane? She was nothing to him now. But the picture? What was he to say of that? It held the secret of his life and told his story. It had taught him to love his own beauty. Would it teach him to loathe his own soul? Would he ever look at it again? No. It was merely an illusion wrought on the troubled senses. The horrible night that he had passed had left phantoms behind it. Suddenly there had fallen upon his brain that tiny scarlet speck that makes men mad. The picture had not changed. It was folly to think so. Yet it was watching him, with its beautiful marred face and its cruel smile. Its bright hair gleamed in the early sunlight. Its blue eyes met his own. A sense of infinite pity, not for himself, but for the painted image of himself, came over him. It had altered already, and would alter more. Its gold would wither into grey. Its red and white roses would die. For every sin that he committed, a stain would fleck and wreck its fairness but he would not sin. The picture, changed or unchanged, would be to him the visible emblem of conscience. He would resist temptation. He would not see Lord Henry any more, would not at any rate listen to those subtle, poisonous theories that in Basil Hallward's garden had first stirred within him the passion for impossible things. He would go back to Sybil Vane, make her amends, marry her, try to love her again. Yes, it was his duty to do so. She must have suffered more than he had. The fascination that she had exercised over him would return. They would be happy together. His life with her would be beautiful and pure. He got up from his chair and drew a large screen right in front of the portrait, shuddering as he glanced at it. How horrible, he murmured to himself, and he walked across to the window and opened it. When he stepped out onto the grass, he drew a deep breath. The fresh morning air seemed to drive away all his sombre passions. He thought only of Sybil. A faint echo of his love came back to him. He repeated her name over and over again. The birds that were singing in the dew-drenched garden seemed to be telling the flowers about her. Chapter 8 It was long past noon when he awoke. His valet had crept several times on tiptoe into the room to see if he was stirring, and had wondered what made his young master sleep so late. Finally his bell sounded, and Victor came in softly with a cup of tea and a pile of letters on a small tray of old Sèvres china, and drew back the olive satin curtains with their shimmering blue lining that hung in front of the three tall windows. Monsieur has slept well as this morning, he said, smiling. What o'clock is it, Victor? asked Dorian Gray drowsily. One hour and a quarter, monsieur. How late it was. He sat up and, having sipped some tea, turned over his letters. One of them was from Lord Henry and had been brought by hand that morning. He hesitated for a moment and then put it aside. The others he opened listlessly. They contained the usual collection of cards, invitations to dinner, tickets for private views, programmes of charity concerts and the like that are showered on fashionable young men every morning during the season. 
There was a rather heavy bill for a chased silver Louis XV toilet set that he had not yet had the courage to send on to his guardians, who were extremely old-fashioned people and did not realise that we live in an age when unnecessary things are our only necessities. And there were several very courteously worded communications from German street money lenders offering to advance any sum of money at a moment's notice and at the most reasonable rates of interest. After about ten minutes, he got up, and throwing on an elaborate dressing gown of silk-embroidered cashmere wool, passed into the onyx-paved bathroom. The cool water refreshed him after his long sleep. He seemed to have forgotten all that he had gone through. A dim sense of having taken part in some strange tragedy came to him once or twice, but there was the unreality of a dream about it. As soon as he was dressed, he went into the library and sat down to a light French breakfast that had been laid out for him on a small round table close to the open window. It was an exquisite day. The warm air seemed laden with spices. A bee flew in and buzzed round the blue dragon bowl that filled with sulphur yellow roses stood before him. He felt perfectly happy. Suddenly, his eye fell on the screen that he had placed in front of the portrait, and he started. To call for monsieur? asked his valet, putting an omelette on the table. I shut the window. Dorian shook his head. I'm not cold, he murmured. Was it all true? Had the portrait really changed? Or had it been simply his own imagination that had made him see a look of evil where there had been a look of joy? Surely a painted canvas could not alter. The thing was absurd. It would serve as a tale to tell Basil some day. It would make him smile. And yet how vivid was his recollection of the whole thing? First in the dim twilight and then in the bright dawn, he had seen the touch of cruelty round the warped lips. He almost dreaded his valet leaving the room. He knew that when he was alone, he would have to examine the portrait. He was afraid of certainty. When the coffee and cigarettes had been brought and the man turned to go, he felt a wild desire to tell him to remain. As the door was closing behind him, he called him back. The man stood waiting for his orders. Dorian looked at him for a moment. I am not at home to anyone, Victor, he said with a sigh. The man bowed and retired. Then he rose from the table, lit a cigarette, and flung himself down on a luxuriously cushioned couch that stood facing the screen. The screen was an old one, of gilt Spanish leather, stamped and wrought with a rather florid Louis XIV pattern. He scanned it curiously, wondering if ever before it had concealed the secret of a man's life. Should he move it aside after all? Why not let it stay there? What was the use of knowing? If the thing was true, it was terrible. If it was not true, why trouble about it? But what if, by some fate or deadlier chance, eyes other than his spied behind and saw the horrible change? What should he do if Basil Hallward came and asked to look at his own picture? Basil would be sure to do that. No, the thing had to be examined and at once. Anything would be better than this dreadful state of doubt. He got up and locked both doors. At least he would be alone when he looked upon the mask of his shame. Then he drew the screen aside and saw himself face to face. It was perfectly true. The portrait had altered. As he often remembered afterwards, and always with no small wonder, he found himself at first gazing at the portrait with a feeling of almost scientific interest. That such a change should have taken place was incredible to him, and yet it was a fact. Was there some subtle affinity between the chemical atoms that shaped themselves into form and colour on the canvas, and the soul that was within him? Could it be that what that soul thought, they realised? That what it dreamed, they made true? Or was there some other, more terrible reason? He shuddered and felt afraid, and going back to the couch, lay there, gazing at the picture in sickened horror. One thing, however, he felt that it had done for him. It had made him conscious of how unjust, how cruel he had been to Sybil Vane. It was not too late to make reparation for that. She could still be his wife. His unreal and selfish love would yield to some higher influence, would be transformed into some nobler passion, and the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted of him would be a guide to him through life would be to him what holiness is to some and conscience to others and the fear of God to us all. There were opiates for remorse, drugs that could lull the moral sense to sleep, 
but here was a visible symbol of the degradation of sin. Here was an ever-present sign of the ruin men brought upon their souls. Three o'clock struck, and four, and the half-hour rang its double chime, but Dorian Gray did not stir. He was trying to gather up the scarlet threads of life, and to weave them into a pattern, to find his way through the sanguine labyrinth of passion through which he was wandering. He did not know what to do, or what to think. Finally, he went over to the table and wrote a passionate letter to the girl he had loved, imploring her forgiveness and accusing himself of madness. He covered page after page with wild words of sorrow and wilder words of pain. There is a luxury in self-reproach. When we blame ourselves, we feel that no one else has a right to blame us. It is the confession, not the priest, that gives us absolution. When Dorian had finished the letter, he felt that he had been forgiven. Suddenly there came a knock to the door, and he heard Lord Henry's voice outside. My dear boy, I must see you. Let me in at once. I can't bear your shutting yourself up like this. He made no answer at first, but remained quite still. The knocking still continued and grew louder. Yes, it was better to let Lord Henry in, and to explain to him the new life he was going to lead, to quarrel with him if it became necessary to quarrel, to part if parting was inevitable. He jumped up, drew the screen hastily across the picture, and unlocked the door. I am so sorry for it all, Dorian, said Lord Henry as he entered, but you must not think too much about it. Do you mean about Sybil Vane? asked the lad. Yes, of course, answered Lord Henry, sinking into a chair and slowly pulling off his yellow gloves. It is dreadful from one point of view, but it was not your fault. Tell me, did you go behind and see her after the play was over? Yes, I felt sure you had. Did you make a scene with her? I was brutal, Harry, perfectly brutal. But it is all right now. I am not sorry for anything that has happened. It has taught me to know myself better. Ah, Dorian, I am so glad you take it in that way. I was afraid I would find you plunged in remorse and tearing that nice curly hair of yours. I have got through all that, said Dorian, shaking his head and smiling. I am perfectly happy now. I know what conscience is to begin with. It is not what you told me it was. It is the divinest thing in us. Don't sneer at it, Harry, any more, at least not before me. I want to be good. I can't bear the idea of my soul being hideous. A very charming artistic basis for ethics, Dorian. I congratulate you on it. But how are you going to begin? By marrying Sybil Vane. Marrying Sybil Vane? cried Lord Henry, standing up and looking at him in perplexed amazement. But my dear Dorian... Yes, Harry, I know what you're going to say. Something dreadful about marriage. Don't say it. Don't ever say things of that kind to me again. Two days ago, I asked Sybil to marry me. I'm not going to break my word to her. She is to be my wife. Your wife? Dorian, didn't you get my letter? I wrote to you this morning and sent the note down by my own man. Your letter? Oh, yes, I remember. I have not read it yet, Harry. I was afraid there might be something in it that I wouldn't like. You cut life to pieces with your epigrams. You know nothing, then. What do you mean? Lord Henry walked across the room, and sitting down by Dorian Gray, took both his hands in his own and held them tightly. Dorian, he said, my letter, don't be frightened, was to tell you that Sybil Vane is dead. A cry of pain broke from the lad's lips, and he leapt to his feet, tearing his hands away from Lord Henry's grasp. Dead? Sybil dead? It is not true. It is a horrible lie. How dare you say it? It is quite true, Dorian, said Lord Henry gravely. It is in all the morning papers. I wrote down to you to ask you not to see anyone till I came. There will have to be an inquest, of course, and you must not be mixed up in it. Things like that make a man fashionable in Paris, but in London people are so prejudiced. Here one should never make one's debut with a scandal. One should reserve that to give an interest to one's old age. I suppose they don't know your name at the theatre. If they don't, it is all right. Did anyone see you going round to her room? That is an important point. Dorian did not answer for a few moments. He was dazed with horror. Finally, he stammered in a stifled voice. Harry, did you say an inquest? What did you mean by that? Did Sybil... 
Oh, Harry, I can't bear it, but be quick. Tell me everything at once. I have no doubt it was not an accident, Dorian, though it must be put in that way to the public. It seems that as she was leaving the theatre with her mother, about half past twelve or so, she said she had forgotten something upstairs. They waited some time for her, but she did not come down again. They ultimately found her lying dead on the floor of her dressing room. She had swallowed something by mistake, some dreadful thing they use at theatres. I don't know what it was, but it had either prussic acid or white lead in it. I should fancy it was prussic acid, as she seems to have died instantaneously. Harry, Harry, it is terrible, cried the lad. Yes, it is very tragic, of course, but you must not get yourself mixed up in it. I see by the standard that she was seventeen. I should have thought she was almost younger than that. She looked such a child, and seemed to know so little about acting. Dorian, you mustn't let this thing get on your nerves. You must come and dine with me, and afterwards we will look in at the opera. It is a patty night, and everybody will be there. You can come to my sister's box. She's got some smart women with her. So I have murdered Sybil Vane, said Dorian Gray, half to himself. Murdered her as surely as if I had cut her little throat with a knife. Yet the roses are not less lovely for all that. The birds sing just as happily in my garden. And tonight I am to dine with you and then go on to the opera and sup somewhere, I suppose, afterwards. How extraordinarily dramatic life is. If I had read all this in a book, Harry, I think I would have wept over it. Somehow, now that it has happened actually, and to me, it seems far too wonderful for tears. Here is the first passionate love letter I have ever written in my life. Strange that my first passionate love letter should have been addressed to a dead girl. Can they feel, I wonder, those white, silent people we call the dead? Sybil, can she feel or know or listen? Oh, Harry, how I loved her once. It seems years ago to me now. She was everything to me. Then came that dreadful night. Was it really only last night when she played so badly and my heart almost broke? She explained it all to me. It was terribly pathetic. But I was not moved a bit. I thought her shallow. Suddenly something happened that made me afraid. I can't tell you what it was, but it was terrible. I said I would go back to her. I felt I had done wrong. And now she is dead. My God, my God. God, Harry, what shall I do? You don't know the danger I am in, and there is nothing to keep me straight. She would have done that for me. She had no right to kill herself. It was selfish of her. My dear Dorian, answered Lord Henry, taking a cigarette from his case and producing a gold Latin matchbox. The only way a woman can ever reform a man is by boring him so completely that he loses all possible interest in life. If you had married this girl, you would have been wretched. Of course, you would have treated her kindly. One can always be kind to people about whom one cares nothing. But she would have soon found out that you were absolutely indifferent to her. And when a woman finds that out about her husband, she either becomes dreadfully dowdy or wears very smart bonnets that some other woman's husband has to pay for. I say nothing about the social mistake, which would have been abject, which, of course, I would not have allowed, but I assure you that in any case the whole thing would have been an absolute failure. I suppose it would, muttered the lad walking up and down the room and looking horribly pale. But I thought it was my duty. It is not my fault that this terrible tragedy has prevented my doing what was right. I remember your saying once that there is a fatality about good resolutions, that they are always made too late. Mine certainly were. Good resolutions are useless attempts to interfere with scientific laws. Their origin is pure vanity. Their result is absolutely nil. They give us now and then some of those luxurious, sterile emotions that have a certain charm for the weak. That is all that can be said for them. They are simply checks that men draw on a bank where they have no account. Harry, cried Dorian Gray, coming over and sitting down beside him. Why is it that I cannot feel this tragedy as much as I want to? I don't think I am heartless. Do you? You have done too many foolish things during the last fortnight to be entitled to give yourself that name, Dorian answered Lord Henry, with his sweet, melancholy smile. The lad frowned. I don't like that explanation, Harry, he rejoined. But I am glad you don't think I am heartless. I am nothing of the kind, I know I am not. And yet I must admit that this thing that has happened does not affect me as it should. It seems to me to be simply like a wonderful ending to a wonderful play, 
It has all the terrible beauty of a Greek tragedy, a tragedy in which I took a great part, but by which I have not been wounded. It is an interesting question, said Lord Henry, who found an exquisite pleasure in playing on the lad's unconscious egotism. An extremely interesting question. I fancy that the true explanation is this. It often happens that the real tragedies of life occur in such an inartistic manner that they hurt us by their crude violence, their absolute incoherence, their absurd want of meaning, their entire lack of style. They affect us just as vulgarity affects us. They give us an impression of sheer brute force, and we revolt against that. Sometimes, however, a tragedy that possesses artistic elements of beauty crosses our lives. If these elements of beauty are real, the whole thing simply appeals to our sense of dramatic effect. Suddenly we find that we are no longer the actors but the spectators of the play, or rather we are both. We watch ourselves, and the mere wonder of the spectacle enthralls us. In the present case, what is it that has really happened? Someone has killed herself for love of you. I wish that I had ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. The people who have adored me, there have not been very many, but there have been some, have always insisted on living on, long after I had ceased to care for them, or they to care for me. They have become stout and tedious, and when I meet them they go in at once for reminiscences. That awful memory of woman, what a fearful thing it is, and what an utter intellectual stagnation it reveals. One should absorb the colour of life, but one should never remember its details. Details are always vulgar. I must sow poppies in my garden, sighed Dorian. There is no necessity, rejoined his companion. Life has always poppies in her hands. Of course, now and then things linger. I once wore nothing but violets all through one season, as a form of artistic mourning for a romance that would not die. Ultimately, however, it did die. I forget what killed it. I think it was her proposing to sacrifice the whole world for me. That is always a dreadful moment. It fills one with the terror of eternity. Well, would you believe it, a week ago, at Lady Hampshire's, I found myself seated at dinner next the lady in question, and she insisted on going over the whole thing again and digging up the past and raking up the future. I had buried my romance in a bed of asphodel. She dragged it out again and assured me that I had spoiled her life. I am bound to state that she ate an enormous dinner, so I did not feel any anxiety. But what a lack of taste she showed. The one charm of the past is that it is the past, but women never know when the curtain has fallen. They always want a sixth act, and as soon as the interest of the play is entirely over, they propose to continue it. If they were allowed their own way, every comedy would have a tragic ending, and every tragedy would culminate in a farce. They are charmingly artificial, but they have no sense of art. You are more fortunate than I am, I assure you, Dorian, that not one of the women I have known would have done for me what Sybil Vane did for you. Ordinary women always console themselves. Some of them do it by going in for sentimental colours. Never trust a woman who wears mauve, whatever her age may be, or a woman over thirty-five who is fond of pink ribbons. It always means that they have a history. Others find a great consolation in suddenly discovering the good qualities of their husbands. They flaunt their conjugal felicity in one's face as if it were the most fascinating of sins. Religion consoles some. Its mysteries have all the charm of a flirtation, a woman once told me and I can quite understand it. Besides, nothing makes one so vain as being told that one is a sinner. Conscience makes egoists of us all. Yes, there is really no end to the consolations that women find in modern life. Indeed, I have not mentioned the most important one. What is that, Harry? said the lad listlessly. Oh, the obvious consolation. Taking someone else's admirer when one loses one's own. In good society that always whitewashes a woman. But really, Dorian, how different Sybil Vane must have been from all the women one meets. There is something to me quite beautiful about her death. I am glad I am living in a century when such wonders happen. They make one believe in the reality of the things we all play with, such as romance, passion, and love. I was terribly cruel to her. You forget that. I am afraid that women appreciate cruelty, downright cruelty more than anything else, they have wonderfully primitive instincts. We have emancipated them, but they remain slaves looking for their masters all the same. They love being dominated. I am sure you were splendid. I have never seen you really and absolutely angry, but I can fancy how delightful you looked. And after all, 
You said something to me the day before yesterday that seemed to me at the time to be merely fanciful, but that I see now was absolutely true, and it holds the key to everything. What was that, Harry? You said to me that Sybil Vane represented to you all the heroines of romance, that she was Desdemona one night and Ophelia the other, that if she died as Juliet, she came to life as Imogen. She will never come to life again now, muttered the lad, burying his face in his hands. No, she will never come to life. She has played her last part, but you must think of that lonely death in the tawdry dressing room simply as a strange, lurid fragment from some Jacobean tragedy, as a wonderful scene from Webster or Ford or Cyril Tourneur. The girl never really lived, and so she has never really died. To you, at least, she was always a dream, a phantom that flitted through Shakespeare's plays and left them lovelier for its presence, a reed through which Shakespeare's music sounded richer and more full of joy. The moment she touched actual life, she marred it, and it marred her, and so she passed away. Mourn for Ophelia, if you like. Put ashes on your head because Cordelia was strangled. Cry out against heaven because the daughter of Brabantio died. But don't waste your tears over Sybil Vane. She was less real than they are. There was a silence. The evening darkened in the room. Noiselessly and with silver feet, the shadows crept in from the garden. The colours faded wearily out of things. After some time, Dorian Gray looked up. You have explained me to myself, Harry, he murmured, with something of a sigh of relief. I felt all that you had said, but somehow I was afraid of it, and I could not express it to myself, how well you know me. But we will not talk again of what has happened. It has been a marvellous experience, that is all. I wonder if life has still in store for me anything as marvellous. Life has everything in store for you, Dorian. There is nothing that you, with your extraordinary good looks, will not be able to do. But suppose, Harry, I become haggard and old and wrinkled. What then? Ah, then, said Lord Henry, rising to go, then, my dear Dorian, you would have to fight for your victories. As it is, they are brought to you. No, you must keep your good looks. We live in an age that reads too much to be wise and that thinks too much to be beautiful. We cannot spare you. And now you had better dress and drive down to the club. We are rather late as it is. I think I shall join you at the opera, Harry. I feel too tired to eat anything. What is the number of your sister's box? Twenty-seven, I believe. It is on the grand tier. You will see her name on the door. But I am sorry you won't come and dine. I don't feel up to it, said Dorian, listlessly. But I am awfully obliged to you for all that you have said to me. You are certainly my best friend. No one has ever understood me as you have. We are only at the beginning of our friendship, Dorian, answered Lord Henry, shaking him by the hand. Goodbye. I shall see you before 9.30, I hope. Remember, Patty is singing. As he closed the door behind him, Dorian Gray touched the bell, and in a few minutes Victor appeared with the lamps and drew the blinds down. He waited impatiently for him to go. The man seemed to take an interminable time over everything. As soon as he had left, he rushed to the screen and drew it back. No, there was no further change in the picture. It had received the news of Sybil Vane's death before he had known of it himself. It was conscious of the events of life as they occurred. The vicious cruelty that marred the fine lines of the mouth had, no doubt, appeared at the very moment that the girl had drunk the poison, whatever it was. Or was it indifferent to results? Did it merely take cognizance of what passed within the soul? He wondered and hoped that some day he would see the change taking place before his very eyes, shuddering as he hoped it. Poor Sybil. What a romance it had all been. She had often mimicked death on the stage, then death himself had touched her and taken her with him. How had she played that dreadful last scene? Had she cursed him as she died? No. She had died for love of him, and love would always be a sacrament to him now. She had atoned for everything by the sacrifice she had made of her life. He would not think any more of what she had made him go through on that horrible night at the theatre. When he thought of her, it would be as a wonderful, tragic figure sent onto the world stage to show the supreme reality of a love. A wonderful, tragic figure. Tears came to his eyes as he remembered her childlike look and winsome, fanciful ways and shy, tremulous grace. He brushed them away hastily, and looked again at the picture. 
He felt that the time had really come for making his choice. Or had his choice already been made? Yes. Life had decided that for him. Life and his own infinite curiosity about life. Eternal youth, infinite passion, pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. He was to have all these things. The portrait was to bear the burden of his shame. That was all. A feeling of pain crept over him as he thought of the desecration that was in store for the fair face on the canvas. Once, in boyish mockery of Narcissus, he had kissed or feigned to kiss those painted lips that now smiled so cruelly at him. Morning after morning he had sat before the portrait wondering at its beauty, almost enamoured of it as it seemed to him at times. Was it to alter now with every mood to which he yielded? Was it to become a monstrous and loathsome thing to be hidden away in a locked room, to be shut out from the sunlight that had so often touched to brighter gold the waving wonder of its hair? The pity of it, the pity of it. For a moment he thought of praying that the horrible sympathy that existed between him and the picture might cease. It had changed in answer to a prayer. Perhaps in answer to a prayer it might remain unchanged. And yet... Who that knew anything about life would surrender the chance of remaining always young, however fantastic that chance might be, or with what fateful consequences it might be fraught? Besides, was it really under his control? Had it indeed been prayer that had produced the substitution? Might there not be some curious scientific reason for it all? If thought could exercise its influence upon a living organism, might not thought exercise an influence upon dead and inorganic things? Nay, without thought or conscious desire, might not things external to ourselves vibrate in unison with our moods and passions, atom calling to atom in secret love or strange affinity? But the reason was of no importance. He would never again tempt by a prayer any terrible power. If the picture was to alter, it was to alter. That was all. Why inquire too closely into it? For there would be a real pleasure in watching it, he would be able to follow his mind into its secret places. This portrait would be to him the most magical of mirrors. As it had revealed to him his own body, so it would reveal to him his own soul. And when winter came upon it, he would still be standing where spring trembles on the verge of summer. When the blood crept from its face and left behind a pallid mask of chalk with leaden eyes, he would keep the glamour of boyhood. Not one blossom of his loveliness would ever fade. Not one pulse of his life would ever weaken. Like the gods of the Greeks, he would be strong and fleet and joyous. What did it matter what happened to the coloured image on the canvas? He would be safe. That was everything. He drew the screen back into its former place in front of the picture, smiling as he did so, and passed into his bedroom, where his valet was already waiting for him. An hour later he was at the opera, and Lord Henry was leaning over his chair. Chapter 9 As he was sitting at breakfast the next morning, Basil Hallward was shown into the room. I am so glad I have found you, Dorian, he said gravely. I called last night and they told me you were at the opera. Of course I knew that was impossible, but I wish you had left word where you had really gone to. I passed a dreadful evening, half afraid that one tragedy might be followed by another. I think you might have telegraphed for me when you heard of it first. I read of it quite by chance in a late edition of The Globe that I picked up at the club. I came here at once and was miserable at not finding you. I can't tell you how heartbroken I am about the whole thing. I know what you must suffer. But where were you? Did you go down and see the girl's mother? For a moment I thought of following you there. They gave the address in the paper somewhere in the Euston Road, isn't it? but I was afraid of intruding upon a sorrow that I could not lighten. Poor woman, what a state she must be in, and her only child, too. What did she say about it all? My dear Basil, how do I know? Murmured Dorian Gray, sipping some pale yellow wine from a delicate gold-beaded bubble of Venetian glass and looking dreadfully bored. I was at the opera. You should have come on there. I met Lady Gwendolyn, Harry's sister, for the first time. We were in her box... She is perfectly charming, and Patty sang divinely. Don't talk about horrid subjects. If one doesn't talk about a thing, it has never happened. It is simply expression, as Harry says, that gives reality to things. I may mention that she was not the woman's only child. There is a son, a charming fellow, I believe. 
but he is not on the stage. He is a sailor or something. And now, tell me about yourself and what you are painting. You went to the opera, said Horwood, speaking very slowly and with a strained touch of pain in his voice. You went to the opera while Sybil Vane was lying dead in some sordid lodging. You can talk to me of other women being charming and of Patty singing divinely before the girl you loved as even the quiet of a grave to sleep in. Why, man, there are horrors in store for that little white body of hers. Stop, Basil, I won't hear it, cried Dorian, leaping to his feet. You must not tell me about things. What is done is done. What is past is past. You call yesterday the past. What has the actual lapse of time got to do with it? It is only shallow people who require years to get rid of an emotion. A man who is master of himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them and to dominate them. Dorian, this is horrible. Something has changed you completely. You look exactly the same wonderful boy who day after day used to come down to my studio to sit for his picture. But you were simple, natural and affectionate then. You were the most unspoiled creature in the whole world. Now I don't know what has come over you. You talk as if you had no heart, no pity in you. It is all Harry's influence, I see that. The lad flushed up, and going to the window, looked out for a few moments on the green, flickering, sun-lashed garden. I owe a great deal to Harry, Basil, he said at last, more than I owe to you. You only taught me to be vain. Well, I am punished for that, Dorian, or shall be some day. I don't know what you mean, Basil, he exclaimed, turning round. I don't know what you want. What do you want? I want the Dorian Gray I used to paint, said the artist sadly. Basil, said the lad, going over to him and putting his hand on his shoulder. You have come too late. Yesterday, when I heard that Sybil Vane had killed herself. Killed herself? Good heavens, is there no doubt about that? cried Hallward, looking up at him with an expression of horror. My dear Basil, surely you don't think it was a vulgar accident? Of course she killed herself. The elder man buried his face in his hands. How fearful, he muttered, and a shudder ran through him. No, said Dorian Gray, there is nothing fearful about it. It is one of the great romantic tragedies of the age. As a rule, people who act lead the most commonplace lives. They are good husbands, or faithful wives, or something tedious. You know what I mean, middle-class virtue and all that kind of thing. How different Sybil was. She lived her finest tragedy. She was always a heroine. The last night she played, the night you saw her, she acted badly because she had known the reality of love. When she knew its unreality, she died, as Juliet might have died. She passed again into the sphere of art. There is something of the martyr about her. Her death has all the pathetic uselessness of martyrdom, all its wasted beauty. But, as I was saying, you must not think I have not suffered. If you had come in yesterday at a particular moment, about half-past five, perhaps, or a quarter to six, you would have found me in tears. Even Harry, who was here, who brought me the news, in fact, had no idea what I was going through. I suffered immensely. Then it passed away. I cannot repeat an emotion. No one can, except sentimentalists. And you are awfully unjust, Basil. You come down here to console me, that is charming of you. You find me consoled and you are furious. How like a sympathetic person. You remind me of a story Harry told me about a certain philanthropist who spent twenty years of his life in trying to get some grievance redressed or some unjust law altered. I forget exactly what it was. Finally, he succeeded, and nothing could exceed his disappointment. He had absolutely nothing to do, almost died of ennui, and became a confirmed misanthrope. And besides, my dear old Basil, if you really want to console me, Teach me rather to forget what has happened, or to see it from a proper artistic point of view. Was it not Gautier who used to write about La Constellation des Arts? I remember picking up a little vellum-covered book in your studio one day and chancing on that delightful phrase. Well, I am not like that young man you told me of when we were down at Marlowe together, the young man who used to say that yellow satin could console one for all the miseries of life. I love beautiful things that one can touch and handle, old brocades, green bronzes, lacquer work, carved ivories, exquisite surroundings, luxury, pomp. There is much to be got from all these. But the artistic temperament that they create, or at any rate reveal, is still more to me. 
To become the spectator of one's own life, as Harry says, is to escape the suffering of life. I know you are surprised at my talking to you like this. You have not realised how I have developed. I was a schoolboy when you knew me. I am a man now. I have new passions, new thoughts, new ideas. I am different, but you must not like me less. I am changed, but you must always be my friend. Of course I am very fond of Harry, but I know that you are better than he is. You are not stronger, you are too much afraid of life, but you are better. And how happy we used to be together. Don't leave me, Basil, and don't quarrel with me. I am what I am. There is nothing more to be said. The painter felt strangely moved. The lad was infinitely dear to him, and his personality had been the great turning point in his art. He could not bear the idea of reproaching him any more. After all, his indifference was probably merely a mood that would pass away. There was so much in him that was good, so much in him that was noble. Well, Dorian, he said at length with a sad smile, I won't speak to you again about this horrible thing after today. I only trust your name won't be mentioned in connection with it. The inquest is to take place this afternoon. Have they summoned you? Dorian shook his head, and a look of annoyance passed over his face at the mention of the word inquest. There was something so crude and vulgar about everything of the kind. They don't know my name, he answered. But surely she did. Only my Christian name, and that I am quite sure she never mentioned to anyone. She told me once that they were all rather curious to learn who I was, and that she invariably told them my name was Prince Charming. It was pretty of her. You must do me a drawing of Sybil, Basil. I should like to have something more of her than the memory of a few kisses and some broken, pathetic words. I will try and do something, Dorian, if it would please you. But you must come and sit to me yourself again. I can't get on without you. I can never sit to you again, Basil. It is impossible, he exclaimed, starting back. The painter stared at him. My dear boy, what nonsense, he cried. Do you mean to say you don't like what I did of you? Where is it? Why have you pulled the screen in front of it? Let me look at it. It is the best thing I have ever done. Do take the screen away, Dorian. It is simply disgraceful of your servant hiding my work like that. I felt the room look different as I came in. My servant has nothing to do with it, Basil. You don't imagine I let him arrange my room for me. He settles my flowers for me sometimes, that is all. No, I did it myself. The light was too strong on the portrait. Too strong? Surely not, my dear fellow. It is an admirable place for it. Let me see it and Hallward walked towards the corner of the room. A cry of terror broke from Dorian Gray's lips, and he rushed between the painter and the screen. Basil, he said, looking very pale. You must not look at it. I don't wish you to. Not look at my own work? You are not serious. Why shouldn't I look at it? exclaimed Hallward, laughing. If you try to look at it, Basil, on my word of honour, I will never speak to you again as long as I live. I am quite serious. I don't offer any explanation and you are not to ask for any. But remember, if you touch this screen, everything is over between us. Horwood was thunderstruck. He looked at Dorian Gray in absolute amazement. He had never seen him like this before. The lad was actually pallid with rage. His hands were clenched and the pupils of his eyes were like discs of blue fire. He was trembling all over. Dorian, don't speak. But what is the matter? Of course I won't look at it if you don't want me to, he said, rather coldly, turning on his heel and going over towards the window. But really it seems rather absurd that I shouldn't see my own work, especially as I'm going to exhibit it in Paris in the autumn. I shall probably have to give it another coat of varnish before that, so I must see it some day, and why not today? To exhibit it? You want to exhibit it? exclaimed Dorian Gray, a strange sense of terror creeping over him. Was the world going to be shown his secret? Were people to gape at the mystery of his life? That was impossible. Something, he did not know what, had to be done at once. Yes, I don't suppose you will object to that. Georges Petit is going to collect all my best pictures for a special exhibition in the Rue de Sez, which will open the first week in October. The portrait will only be away a month. I should think you could easily spare it for that time. In fact, you are sure to be out of town and if you keep it always behind a screen, you can't care much about it. Dorian Gray passed his hand over his forehead. There were beads of perspiration there. He felt that he was on the brink of a horrible danger. You told me a month ago that you would never exhibit it, he cried. Why have you changed your mind? 
You people who go in for being consistent have just as many moods as others have. The only difference is that your moods are rather meaningless. You can't have forgotten that you assured me most solemnly that nothing in the world would induce you to send it to any exhibition. You told Harry exactly the same thing. He stopped suddenly, and a gleam of light came into his eyes. He remembered that Lord Henry had said to him once, half seriously and half in jest, if you want to have a strange quarter of an hour, get Basil to tell you why he won't exhibit your picture. He told me why he wouldn't, and it was a revelation to me. Yes, perhaps Basil too had his secret. He would ask him and try. Basil, he said, coming over quite close and looking him straight in the face, we have each of us a secret. Let me know yours, and I shall tell you mine. What was your reason for refusing to exhibit my picture? The painter shuddered in spite of himself. Dorian, if I told you, you might like me less than you do, and you would certainly laugh at me. I could not bear your doing either of those two things. If you wish me never to look at your picture again, I am content. I have always you to look at. If you wish the best work I have ever done to be hidden from the world, I am satisfied. Your friendship is dearer to me than any fame or reputation. No, Basil. You must tell me, insisted Dorian Gray. I think I have a right to know. His feeling of terror had passed away, and curiosity had taken its place. He was determined to find out Basil Hallward's mystery. Let us sit down, Dorian, said the painter, looking troubled. Let us sit down and just answer me one question. Have you noticed in the picture something curious? Something that probably at first did not strike you, but that revealed itself to you suddenly? Basil! cried the lad, clutching the arms of his chair with trembling hands and gazing at him with wild, startled eyes. I see you did. Don't speak. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Dorian, from the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence over me. I was dominated, soul, brain and power by you. You became to me the visible incarnation of that unseen ideal whose memory haunts us artists like an exquisite dream. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When you were away from me, you were still present in my art. Of course, I never let you know anything about this. It would have been impossible. You would not have understood it. I hardly understood it myself. I only knew that I had seen perfection face to face, and that the world had become wonderful to my eyes, too wonderful, perhaps, for in such mad worships there is peril, the peril of losing them, no less than the peril of keeping them. Weeks and weeks went on, and I grew more and more absorbed in you. Then came a new development. I had drawn you as Paris in dainty armour, and as Adonis with huntsman's cloak and polished boar spear, Crowned with heavy lotus blossoms, you had sat on the prow of Adrian's barge, gazing across the green turbid Nile. You had leant over the still pool of some Greek woodland, and seen in the water's silent silver the marvel of your own face. And it had all been what art should be, unconscious, ideal, and remote. One day, a fatal day I sometimes think, I determined to paint a wonderful portrait of you as you actually are, not in the costume of dead ages, but in your own dress and in your own time. Whether it was the realism of the method or the mere wonder of your own personality, thus directly presented to me without mist or veil, I cannot tell. But I know that as I worked at it, every flake and film of colour seemed to me to reveal my secret. I grew afraid that others would know of my idolatry. I felt, Dorian, that I had told too much, that I had put too much of myself into it. Then it was that I resolved never to allow the picture to be exhibited. You were a little annoyed, but then you did not realise all that it meant to me. Harry, to whom I talked about it, laughed at me, but I did not mind that. When the picture was finished and I sat alone with it, I felt that I was right. Well, after a few days, the thing left my studio, and as soon as I had got rid of the intolerable fascination of its presence, it seemed to me that I had been foolish in imagining that I had seen anything in it, more than that you were extremely good-looking and that I could paint. Even now I cannot help feeling that it is a mistake to think that the passion one feels in creation is ever really shown in the work one creates. Art is always more abstract than we fancy. Form and colour tell us of form and colour. 
That is all. It often seems to me that art conceals the artist far more completely than it ever reveals him. And so when I got this offer from Paris, I determined to make your portrait the principal thing in my exhibition. It never occurred to me that you would refuse. I see now that you were right. The picture cannot be shown. You must not be angry with me, Dorian, for what I have told you. As I said to Harry once, you are made to be worshipped. Dorian Gray drew a long breath. The colour came back to his cheeks and a smile played about his lips. The peril was over. He was safe for the time. Yet he could not help feeling infinite pity for the painter who had just made this strange confession to him and wondered if he himself would ever be so dominated by the personality of a friend. Lord Henry had the charm of being very dangerous, but that was all. He was too clever and too cynical to be really fond of. Would there ever be someone who would fill him with a strange idolatry? Was that one of the things that life had in store? It is extraordinary to me, Dorian, said Horwood, that you should have seen this in the portrait. Did you really see it? I saw something in it, he answered, something that seemed to me very curious. Well, you don't mind my looking at the thing now. Dorian shook his head. You must not ask me that, Basil. I could not possibly let you stand in front of that picture. You will some day, surely. Never. Well, perhaps you are right. And now goodbye, Dorian. You have been the one person in my life who has really influenced my art. Whatever I have done that is good, I owe to you. Ah, you don't know what it cost me to tell you all that I have told you. My dear Basil, said Dorian, what have you told me? Simply that you felt that you admired me too much. That is not even a compliment. It was not intended as a compliment. It was a confession. Now that I have made it, something seems to have gone out of me. Perhaps one should never put one's worship into words. It was a very disappointing confession. Why, what did you expect, Dorian? You didn't see anything else in the picture, did you? There was nothing else to see? No. There was nothing else to see. Why do you ask? But you mustn't talk about worship. It is foolish. You and I are friends, Basil, and we must always remain so. You have got Harry, said the painter, sadly. Oh, Harry, cried the lad, with a ripple of laughter. Harry spends his days in saying what is incredible, and his evenings in doing what is improbable. Just the sort of life I would like to lead, but still I don't think I would go to Harry if I were in trouble. I would sooner go to you, Basil. You will sit to me again. Impossible. You spoil my life as an artist by refusing, Dorian. No man came across two ideal things. Few come across one. I can't explain it to you, Basil, but I must never sit to you again. There is something fatal about a portrait. It has a life of its own. I will come and have tea with you. That will be just as pleasant. Pleasanter for you, I am afraid, murmured Hallward regretfully. And now, goodbye. I am sorry you won't let me look at the picture once again. But that can't be helped. I quite understand what you feel about it. As he left the room, Dorian Gray smiled to himself. Poor Basil. How little he knew of the true reason, and how strange it was that instead of having been forced to reveal his own secret, he had succeeded almost by chance in wresting a secret from his friend. How much that strange confession explained to him. The painter's absurd fits of jealousy, his wild devotion, his extravagant panegyrics, his curious reticences. He understood them all now, and he felt sorry. There seemed to him to be something tragic in a friendship so coloured by romance. He sighed and touched the bell. The portrait must be hidden away at all costs. He could not run such a risk of discovery again. It had been mad of him to have allowed the thing to remain, even for an hour, in a room to which any of his friends had access. Chapter 10 When his servant entered, he looked at him steadfastly and wondered if he had thought of peering behind the screen. The man was quite impassive and waited for his orders. Dorian lit a cigarette and walked over to the glass and glanced into it. He could see the reflection of Victor's face perfectly. It was like a placid mask of servility. There was nothing to be afraid of there. 
yet he thought it best to be on his guard. Speaking very slowly, he told him to tell the housekeeper that he wanted to see her, and then to go to the frame maker and ask him to send two of his men round at once. It seemed to him that as the man left the room, his eyes wandered in the direction of the screen, or was that merely his own fancy? After a few moments, in her black silk dress with old-fashioned thread mittens on her wrinkled hands, Mrs. Leaf bustled into the library. He asked her for the key of the schoolroom. "'The old schoolroom, Mr. Dorian?' she exclaimed. "'Why, it is full of dust. I must get it arranged and put straight before you go into it. It is not fit for you to see, sir. It is not indeed.' "'I don't want it put straight, Leaf. I only want the key. "'Well, sir, you'll be covered with cobwebs if you go into it. "'Why, it hasn't been opened for nearly five years, not since his lordship died.' "'He winced at the mention of his grandfather. "'He had hateful memories of him. "'That does not matter,' he answered. "'I simply want to see the place, that is all. Give me the key.' "'And here is the key, sir,' said the old lady, "'going over the contents of her bunch with tremulously uncertain hands. "'Here is the key.' I'll have it off the bunch in a moment. But you don't think of living up there, sir, and you so comfortable here. No, no, he cried petulantly. Thank you, Leaf, that will do. She lingered for a few moments and was garrulous over some detail of the household. He sighed and told her to manage things as she thought best. She left the room, wreathed in smiles. As the door closed, Dorian put the key in his pocket and looked round the room. His eye fell on a large purple satin coverlet, heavily embroidered with gold, a splendid piece of late 17th century Venetian work that his grandfather had found in a convent near Bologna. Yes, that would serve to wrap the dreadful thing in. It had perhaps served often as a pall for the dead. Now it was to hide something that had a corruption of its own, worse than the corruption of death itself, something that would breed horrors and yet would never die. What the worm was to the corpse his sins would be to the painted image on the canvas. They would mar its beauty and eat away its grace. They would defile it and make it shameful, and yet the thing would still live on. It would be always alive. He shuddered, and for a moment he regretted that he had not told Basil the true reason why he had wished to hide the picture away. Basil would have helped him to resist Lord Henry's influence and the still more poisonous influences that came from his own temperament. The love that he bore him, for it was really love, had nothing in it that was not noble and intellectual. It was not that mere physical admiration of beauty that is born of the senses and that dies when the senses tire. It was such love as Michelangelo had known and Montaigne and Winkleman and Shakespeare himself. Yes, Basil could have saved him, but it was too late now. The past could always be annihilated. Regret, denial or forgetfulness could do that but the future was inevitable. There were passions in him that would find their terrible outlet, dreams that would make the shadow of their real evil. He took up from the couch the great purple and gold texture that covered it, and holding it in his hands, passed behind the screen. Was the face on the canvas viler than before? It seemed to him that it was unchanged, and yet his loathing of it was intensified. Gold hair, blue eyes and rose-red lips. They all were there. It was simply the expression that had altered. That was horrible in its cruelty. Compared to what he saw in it of censure or rebuke, how shallow Basil's reproaches about Sybil Vane had been, how shallow and of what little account. His own soul was looking out at him from the canvas and calling him to judgment. A look of pain came across him, and he flung the rich pall over the picture. As he did so, a knock came to the door. He passed out as his servant entered. The persons are here, monsieur. He felt that the man must be got rid of at once. He must not be allowed to know where the picture was being taken to. There was something sly about him, and he had thoughtful, treacherous eyes. Sitting down at the writing table, he scribbled a note to Lord Henry, asking him to send him round something to read and reminding him that they were to meet at 8.15 that evening. Wait for an answer, he said, handing it to him, and show the men in here. In two or three minutes there was another knock, and Mr Hubbard himself, the celebrated frame-maker of South Audley Street, came in with a somewhat rough-looking young assistant. 
Mr. Hubbard was a florid, red-whiskered little man whose admiration for art was considerably tempered by the inveterate impecuniosity of most of the artists who dealt with him. As a rule, he never left his shop. He waited for people to come to him, but he always made an exception in favour of Dorian Gray. There was something about Dorian that charmed everybody. It was a pleasure even to see him. What can I do for you, Mr. Gray? he said, rubbing his fat, freckled hands. I thought I would do myself the honour of coming round in person. I've just got a beauty of a frame, sir. Picked it up at a sale, old Florentine. Came from Font Hill, I believe. Admirably suited for a religious subject, Mr. Gray. I'm so sorry you have given yourself the trouble of coming round, Mr. Hubbard. I shall certainly drop in and look at the frame, though I don't go in much at present for religious art. But today I only want a picture carried to the top of the house for me. It is rather heavy, so I thought I would ask you to lend me a couple of your men. No trouble at all, Mr. Gray. I am delighted to be of any service to you. Which is the work of art, sir? This, replied Dorian, moving the screen back. Can you move it, covering and all, just as it is? I don't want it to get scratched going upstairs. There will be no difficulty, sir, said the genial frame-maker, beginning with the aid of his assistant to unhook the picture from the long brass chains by which it was suspended. And now, where shall we carry it to, Mr. Gray? I will show you the way, Mr. Hubbard, if you will kindly follow me. Or perhaps you had better go in front. I am afraid it is right at the top of the house. We will go up by the front staircase, as it is wider. He held the door open for them, and they passed out into the hall and began the ascent. The elaborate character of the frame had made the picture extremely bulky, and now and then, in spite of the obsequious protests of Mr. Hubbard, who had the true tradesman's spirited dislike of seeing a gentleman doing anything useful, Dorian put his hand to it so as to help them. Something of a load to carry, sir, gasped the little man when they reached the top landing and he wiped his shiny forehead. I'm afraid it is rather heavy, murmured Dorian, as he unlocked the door that opened into the room that was to keep for him the curious secret of his life and hide his soul from the eyes of men. He had not entered the place for more than four years, not indeed since he had used it first as a playroom when he was a child, and then as a study when he grew somewhat older. It was a large, well-proportioned room which had been specially built by the last Lord Kelso for the use of the little grandson whom, for his strange likeness to his mother, and also for other reasons, he had always hated and desired to keep at a distance. It appeared to Dorian to have but little changed. There was the huge Italian cassone, with its fantastically painted panels and its tarnished gilt mouldings, in which he had so often hidden himself as a boy, there the satin-wood bookcase, filled with his dog-eared schoolbooks. On the wall behind it was hanging the same ragged Flemish tapestry where a faded king and queen were playing chess in a garden, while a company of hawkers rode by, carrying hooded birds on their gauntleted wrists. How well he remembered it all. Every moment of his lonely childhood came back to him as he looked around. He recalled the stainless purity of his boyish life and it seemed horrible to him that it was here the fatal portrait was to be hidden away. How little he had thought, in those dead days, of all that was in store for him. But there was no other place in the house so secure from prying eyes as this. He had the key, and no one else could enter it. Beneath its purple pall, the face painted on the canvas could grow bestial, sodden and unclean. What did it matter? No one could see it. He himself would not see it. Why should he watch the hideous corruption of his soul? He kept his youth, that was enough. And besides, might not his nature grow finer after all? There was no reason that the future should be so full of shame. Some love might come across his life and purify him, and shield him from those sins that seemed to be already stirring in spirit and in flesh. Those curious, unpictured sins whose very mystery lent them their subtlety and their charm. Perhaps, some day, the cruel look would have passed away from the scarlet, sensitive mouth, and he might show to the world Basil Hallward's masterpiece. No, that was impossible. Hour by hour and week by week the thing upon the canvas was growing old. It might escape the hideousness of sin, but the hideousness of age was in store for it. The cheeks would become hollow or flaccid. Yellow crow's feet would creep round the fading eyes and make them horrible. The hair would lose its brightness, the mouth would gape or droop, would be foolish or gross as the mouths of old men are. There would be the wrinkled throat, the cold, blue-veined hands, the twisted body, 
that he remembered in the grandfather who had been so stern to him in his boyhood. The picture had to be concealed. There was no help for it. Bring it in, Mr. Hubbard, please, he said, wearily, turning round. I am sorry I kept you so long. I was thinking of something else. Always glad to have a rest, Mr. Gray, answered the frame maker, who was still gasping for breath. Where shall we put it, sir? Oh, anywhere. Here, this will do. I don't want to have it hung up. Just lean it against the wall, thanks. Might one look at the work of art, sir? Dorian started. It would not interest you, Mr. Hubbard, he said, keeping his eye on the man. He felt ready to leap upon him and fling him to the ground if he dared to lift the gorgeous hanging that concealed the secret of his life. I shan't trouble you any more now. I am much obliged for your kindness in coming round. Not at all, not at all, Mr. Gray. Ever ready to do anything for you, sir. And Mr. Hubbard tramped downstairs, followed by the assistant, who glanced back at Dorian with a look of shy wonder in his rough, uncomely face. He had never seen anyone so marvellous. When the sound of their footsteps had died away, Dorian locked the door and put the key in his pocket. He felt safe now. No one would ever look upon the horrible thing. No eye but his would ever see his shame. On reaching the library, he found that it was just after five o'clock and that the tea had already been brought up. On a little table of dark perfumed wood thickly encrusted with nacre, a present from Lady Radley, his guardian's wife, a pretty professional invalid who had spent the preceding winter in Cairo, was lying a note from Lord Henry, and beside it was a book bound in yellow paper, the cover slightly torn and the edges soiled. A copy of the third edition of The St. James's Gazette had been placed on the tea tray. It was evident that Victor had returned. He wondered if he had met the men in the hall as they were leaving the house and had wormed out of them what they had been doing. He would be sure to miss the picture, had no doubt missed it already while he had been laying the tea things. The screen had not been set back, and a blank space was visible on the wall. Perhaps some night he might find him creeping upstairs and trying to force the door of the room. It was a horrible thing to have a spy in one's house. He had heard of rich men who had been blackmailed all their lives by some servant who had read a letter or overheard a conversation or picked up a card with an address or found beneath a pillow a withered flower or a shred of crumpled lace. He sighed, and having poured himself out some tea, opened Lord Henry's note. It was simply to say that he sent him round the evening paper and a book that might interest him, and that he would be at the club at 8.15. He opened the St. James's languidly and looked through it. A red pencil mark on the fifth page caught his eye. It drew attention to the following paragraph. Inquest on an Actress an inquest was held this morning at the Bell Tavern, Hoxton Road, by Mr. Danby, the district coroner, on the body of Sybil Vane, a young actress recently engaged at the Royal Theatre Hoban. A verdict of death by misadventure was returned. Considerable sympathy was expressed for the mother of the deceased, who was greatly affected during the giving of her own evidence, and that of Dr. Birrell, who had made the post-mortem examination of the deceased. He frowned and tearing the paper in two, went across the room and flung the pieces away. How ugly it all was, and how horribly real ugliness made things. He felt a little annoyed with Lord Henry for having sent him the report, and it was certainly stupid of him to have marked it with red pencil. Victor might have read it. The man knew more than enough English for that. Perhaps he had read it, and had begun to suspect something. And yet what did it matter? What had Dorian Gray to do with Sybil Vane's death? There was nothing to fear. Dorian Gray had not killed her. His eye fell on the yellow book that Lord Henry had sent him. What was it, he wondered. He went towards the little pearl-coloured octagonal stand that had always looked to him like the work of some strange Egyptian bees that wrought in silver, and taking up the volume, flung himself into an armchair and began to turn over the leaves. After a few minutes, he became absorbed. It was the strangest book that he had ever read. It seemed to him that in exquisite raiment and to the delicate sound of flutes, the sins of the world were passing in dumb show before him. Things that he had dimly dreamed of were suddenly made real to him. Things of which he had never dreamed were gradually revealed. It was a novel without a plot and with only one character, 
being indeed simply a psychological study of a certain young Parisian who spent his life trying to realize in the 19th century all the passions and modes of thought that belonged to every century except his own, and to sum up, as it were, in himself the various moods through which the world's spirit had ever passed, loving for their mere artificiality those renunciations that men have unwisely called virtue as much as those natural rebellions that wise men still call sin. The style in which it was written was that curious jewelled style, vivid and obscure at once, full of argo and of archaisms, of technical expressions and of elaborate paraphrases that characterises the work of some of the finest artists of the French school of symboliste. There were in it metaphors as monstrous as orchids and as subtle in colour. The life of the senses was described in the terms of mystical philosophy. One hardly knew at times whether one was reading the spiritual ecstasies of some medieval saint or the morbid confessions of a modern sinner. It was a poisonous book. The heavy odour of incense seemed to cling about its pages and to trouble the brain. The mere cadence of the sentences, the subtle monotony of their music, so full as it was of complex refrains and movements elaborately repeated, produced in the mind of the lad, as he passed from chapter to chapter, a form of reverie a malady of dreaming that made him unconscious of the falling day and creeping shadows. Cloudless and pierced by one solitary star, a copper-green sky gleamed through the windows. He read on by its wan light till he could read no more. Then, after his valet had reminded him several times of the lateness of the hour, he got up and, going into the next room, placed the book on the little Florentine table that always stood at his bedside and began to dress for dinner. It was almost nine o'clock before he reached the club, where he found Lord Henry sitting alone in the morning room looking very much bored. I am so sorry, Harry, he cried, but it really is entirely your fault. That book you sent me so fascinated me that I forgot how the time was going. Yes, I thought you would like it, replied his host, rising from his chair. I didn't say I liked it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. There is a great difference. Ah, you have discovered that murmured Lord Henry, and they passed into the dining room. Chapter 11 For years Dorian Gray could not free himself from the influence of this book, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it. He procured from Paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition and had them bound in different colours, so that they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed, at times, to have almost entirely lost control. The hero, the wonderful young Parisian, in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended, became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself, and indeed the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life, written before he had lived it. In one point he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero, he never knew, never indeed had any cause to know, that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and polished metal surfaces and still water which came upon the young Parisian so early in his life and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a beauty that had once apparently been so remarkable. It was with an almost cruel joy, and perhaps in nearly every joy, as certainly in every pleasure cruelty has its place, that he used to read the latter part of the book, with its really tragic, if somewhat overemphasized, account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and in the world he had most dearly valued. For the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated Basil Hallward and many others besides him seemed never to leave him. Even those who had heard the most evil things against him, and from time to time strange rumours about his mode of life crept through London and became the chatter of the clubs, could not believe anything to his dishonour when they saw him. He had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world. Men who talked grossly became silent when Dorian Gray entered the room. There was something in the purity of his face that rebuked them. His mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence that they had tarnished. They wondered how one so charming and graceful as he was could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual. Often, on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends, or thought that they were so, he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room, 
open the door with the key that never left him now and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted of him, looking now at the evil and aging face on the canvas and now at the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass. The very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure. He grew more and more enamoured of his own beauty, more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul. He would examine with minute care, and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight, the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy sensual mouth, wondering sometimes which were the more horrible, the signs of sin or the signs of age. He would place his white hands beside the coarse, bloated hands of the picture and smile. He mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs. There were moments, indeed, at night, when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber or in the sordid room of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks, which, under an assumed name and in disguise, it was his habit to frequent, he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul with a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish. But moments such as these were rare, that curiosity about life which Lord Henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with gratification. The more he knew, the more he desired to know. He had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them. Yet he was not really reckless, at any rate in his relations to society. Once or twice every month during the winter, and on each Wednesday evening while the season lasted, he would throw open to the world his beautiful house, and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art. His little dinners, in the settling of which Lord Henry always assisted him, were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths and antique plate of gold and silver. Indeed, there were many, especially among the very young men, who saw, or fancied that they saw, in Dorian Gray, the true realisation of a type of which they had often dreamed in Eton or Oxford days, a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world. To them he seemed to be of the company of those whom Dante describes as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty, like Gautier, he was one for whom the visible world existed. And certainly to him, life itself was the first, the greatest of the arts, and for it all the other arts seemed to be but a preparation. Fashion, by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal, and dandyism, which in its own way is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty, had, of course, their fascination for him. His mode of dressing and the particular styles that from time to time he affected had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the Mayfair balls and the Pall Mall club windows who copied him in everything that he did and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful, though to him only half-serious, fopperies. For while he was but too ready to accept the position that was almost immediately offered to him on his coming of age, and found, indeed, a subtle pleasure in the thought that he might really become to the London of his own day what to imperial Neronian Rome the author of the Satyricon once had been. Yet in his inmost heart he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter elegantiarum, to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel, or the knotting of a necktie, or the conduct of a cane. He sought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles, and find in the spiritualizing of the senses its highest realization. The worship of the senses has often, and with much justice, been decried, men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves, and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence. But it appeared to Dorian Gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood and that they had remained savage and animal merely because the world had sought to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain, instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality, of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic. As he looked back upon man moving through history, he was haunted by a feeling of loss. So much had been surrendered, and to such little purpose, 
There had been mad, willful rejections, monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which, in their ignorance, they had sought to escape. Nature, in her wonderful irony, driving out the anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions. Yes, there was to be, as Lord Henry had prophesied, a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh, uncomely puritanism that is having, in our own day, its curious revival. It was to have its service of the intellect, certainly, yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience. Its aim, indeed, was to be experience itself, and not the fruits of experience, sweet or bitter as they might be. Of the asceticism that deadens the senses, as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them, it was to know nothing. But it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment. There are few of us who have not sometimes wakened before dawn, either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamoured of death, or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself, an instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques and that lends to Gothic art its enduring vitality, this art being, one might fancy, especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie. Gradually white fingers creep through the curtains and they appear to tremble. In black, fantastic shapes, dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there, Outside there is the stirring of birds among the leaves or the sound of men going forth to their work, or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it feared to wake the sleepers and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave. Veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted and by degrees the forms and colours of things are restored to them and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern. The wan mirrors get back their mimic life. The flameless tapers stand where we had left them, and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying, or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball, or the letter that we had been afraid to read, or that we had read too often. Nothing seems to us changed. Out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known. We have to resume it where we had left off, and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits, or a wild longing it may be that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure, a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colours and be changed or have other secrets, a world in which the past would have little or no place or survive at any rate, in no conscious form of obligation or regret, the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness and the memories of pleasure their pain. It was the creation of such worlds as these that seemed to Dorian Gray to be the true object, or amongst the true objects, of life. And in his search for sensations that would be at once new and delightful and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance, he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he knew to be really alien to his nature, abandon himself to their subtle influences, and then, having, as it were, caught their colour and satisfied his intellectual curiosity, leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardour of temperament, and that indeed, according to certain modern psychologists, is often a condition of it. It was rumoured of him once that he was about to join the Roman Catholic Communion, and certainly the Roman ritual had always a great attraction for him. The daily sacrifice, more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world, stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolise. He loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff-flowered dalmatic, slowly and with white hands moving aside the veil of the tabernacle, or raising aloft the jewelled, lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid water that at times one would fain think is indeed the Panis Caelestis, the bread of angels, or robed in the garments of the Passion of Christ, breaking the host into the chalice 
and smiting his breast for his sins. The fuming censers that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers had their subtle fascination for him. As he passed out, he used to look with wonder at the black confessionals and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives. But he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system, or of mistaking for a house in which to live an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of a night, or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail. Mysticism, with its marvellous power of making common things strange to us, and the subtle antinomianism that always seems to accompany it, moved him for a season. And for a season he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the Darwinismus movement in Germany, and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pearly cell in the brain or some white nerve in the body, delighting in the conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions, morbid or healthy, normal or diseased. Yet, as has been said of him before, no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself. He felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment. He knew that the senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. And so he would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture, distilling heavily scented oils and burning odorous gums from the east. He saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life, and set himself to discover their true relations, wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical, and in ambergris that stirred one's passions, and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances, and in musk that troubled the brain, and in champak that stained the imagination, and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes, and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots, and scented pollen-laden flowers, of aromatic balms, and of dark and fragrant woods, of spikenard that sickens, of hervenia that makes men mad, and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul. At another time he devoted himself entirely to music, and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive-green lacquer, he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers or grave yellow-shawled Tunisians plucked at the strained strings of monstrous lutes while grinning negroes beat monotonously upon copper drums and crouching upon scarlet mats, slim turbaned Indians blew through long pipes of reed or brass and charmed or feigned to charm great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders. The harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times when Schubert's grace and Chopin's beautiful sorrows and the mighty harmonies of Beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear. He collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found, either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that have survived contact with Western civilizations and loved to touch and try them. He had the mysterious Juruparis of the Rio Negro Indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see till they have been subjected to fasting and scourging and the earthen jars of the Peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds and flutes of human bones such as Alfonso de Ovale heard in Chile and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near the Cusco and give forth a note of singular sweetness. He had painted gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken, the long clarin of the Mexicans, into which the performer does not blow, but through which he inhales the air, the harsh chure of the Amazon tribes that is sounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard, it is said, at a distance of three leagues, the tipanatli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an elastic gum obtained from the milky juice of plants, the yotel bells of the Aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes, and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents, like the one that Bernal Diaz saw when he went with Cortez into the Mexican temple, and of whose doleful sound he has left us so vivid a description. The fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him, 
and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art, like nature, has her monsters, things of bestial shape and with hideous voices. Yet after some time, he wearied of them and would sit in his box at the opera, either alone or with Lord Henry, listening in rapt pleasure to Tannhauser and seeing in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul. On one occasion he took up the study of jewels and appeared at a costume ball as Anne de Joyeuse, Admiral of France, in a dress covered with 560 pearls. This taste enthralled him for years, and indeed may be said never to have left him. He would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected, such as the olive-green chrysoberyl that turns red by lamplight, the simophane with its wire-like line of silver, the pistachio-coloured peridot, rose-pink and wine-yellow topazes, carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars, flame-red cinnamon stones, orange and violet spinels, and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire. He loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milky opal. He procured from Amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of colour and had a turquoise de la vieille roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs. He discovered wonderful stories also about jewels. In Alfonso's Clericalis Disciplina, a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real jacinth, and in the romantic history of Alexander, the conqueror of Emathea, was said to have found in the Vale of Jordan snakes with collars of real emeralds growing on their backs. There was a gem in the brain of the dragon, Philostratus told us, and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe, the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and slain. According to the great alchemist Pierre de Boniface, the diamond rendered a man invisible, and the agate of India made him eloquent. The cornelian appeased anger, and the hyacinth provoked sleep, and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine. The garnet cast out demons, and the hydropecus deprived the moon of her colour. The selenite waxed and waned with the moon, and the melaceus that discovers thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids. Leonardus Camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad. That was a certain antidote against poison. The bazaar that was found in the heart of the Arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague. In the nests of Arabian birds was the aspilates that, according to Democritus, kept the wearer from any danger by fire. The king of Cylon rode through his city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation. The gates of the palace of John the Priest were made of sardius, with the horn of the horned snake inwrought, so that no man might bring poison within. Over the gable were two golden apples, in which were two carbuncles, so that the gold might shine by day and the carbuncles by night. In Lodge's strange romance, A Marguerite of America, it was stated that in the chamber of the Queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world, inchased out of silver, looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites, carbuncles, sapphires and green emeralds. Marco Polo had seen the inhabitants of Zipangu place rose-coloured pearls in the mouths of the dead. A sea monster had been enamoured of the pearl that the diver brought to King Perosi's and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss. When the Huns lured the king into the great pit, he flung it away. Procopius tells the story, nor was it ever found again, though the emperor Anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it. The king of Malabar had shown to a certain Venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls, one for every god that he worshipped. When the Duke of Valentinois, son of Alexander VI, visited Louis XII of France, his horse was loaded with gold leaves, according to Brantome, and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light. Charles of England had ridden in stirrups hung with 421 diamonds. Richard II had a coat, valued at 30,000 marks, which was covered with ballast rubies. Hall described Henry VIII on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold, the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones, and a great bodarique about his neck of large balasses. 
The favourites of James I wore earrings of emeralds set in gold filigrane. Edward II gave to Piers Gaveston a suit of red gold armour studded with jacinths, a collar of gold roses set with turquoise stones, and a skull cap, parsame with pearls. Henry II wore jewelled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients. The ducal hat of Charles the Rash, the last Duke of Burgundy of his race, was hung with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires. How exquisite life had once been, how gorgeous in its pomp and decoration, even to read of the luxury of the dead was wonderful. Then he turned his attention to embroideries and to the tapestries that performed the office of frescoes in the chill rooms of the northern nations of Europe. As he investigated the subject, and he always had an extraordinary faculty of becoming absolutely absorbed for the moment in whatever he took up, he was almost saddened by the reflection of the ruin that time brought on beautiful and wonderful things. He, at any rate, had escaped that. Summer followed summer, and the yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times, and nights of horror repeated the story of their shame. But he was unchanged. No winter marred his face or stained his flower-like bloom. How different it was with material things. Where had they passed to? Where was the great crocus-coloured robe on which the gods fought against the giants that had been worked by grown girls for the pleasure of Athena. Where the huge velarium that Nero had stretched across the Colosseum at Rome, that titan sail of purple on which was represented the starry sky and Apollo driving a chariot drawn by white gilt-reined steeds. He longed to see the curious table napkins wrought for the priest of the sun on which were displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast. The mortuary cloth of King Chilperic, with its three hundred golden bees, the fantastic robes that excited the indignation of the Bishop of Pontus, and were figured with lions, panthers, bears, dogs, forests, rocks, hunters, all in fact that a painter can copy from nature, and the coat that Charles of Orleans once wore, on the sleeves of which were embroidered the verses of a song beginning, Madame, je suis tout joyeux the musical accompaniment of the words being wrought in gold thread, and each note, of square shape in those days, formed with four pearls. He read of the room that was prepared at the Palace of Reims for the use of Queen Joan of Burgundy, and was decorated with 1,321 parrots made in broidery and blazoned with the king's arms and 561 butterflies, whose wings were similarly ornamented with the arms of the queen, the whole worked in gold. Catherine de' Medici had a morning bed made for her of black velvet powdered with crescents and suns. Its curtains were of damask, with leafy wreaths and garlands figured upon a gold and silver ground, and fringed along the edges with broideries of pearls, and it stood in a room hung with rows of the Queen's devices in cut black velvet upon cloth of silver. Louis XIV had gold embroidered caryatids, fifteen feet high in his apartment, the state bed of Sobieski, King of Poland, was made of Smyrna gold brocade embroidered in turquoises with verses from the Koran. Its supports were of silver gilt, beautifully chased and profusely set with enameled and jewelled medallions. It had been taken from the Turkish camp before Vienna, and the standard of Mohammed had stood beneath the tremulous gilt of its canopy. And so for a whole year, he sought to accumulate the most exquisite specimens that he could find of textile and embroidered work, getting the dainty Delhi muslins finely wrought with gold thread palmates and stitched over with iridescent beetles' wings, the Dhaka gauzes that from their transparency are known in the East as woven air and running water and evening dew, strange figured cloths from Java, elaborate yellow Chinese hangings, books bound in tawny satins or fair blue silks and wrought with fleur-de-lis, birds and images, Veils of lacis worked in Hungary point, Sicilian brocades and stiff Spanish velvets, Georgian work with its gilt coins, and Japanese fukusas with their green-toned golds and their marvellously plumaged birds. He had a special passion also for ecclesiastical vestments, as indeed he had for everything connected with the service of the church. In the long cedar chests that lined the west gallery of his house, he had stored away many rare and beautiful specimens of what is really the raiment of the Bride of Christ.
who must wear purple and jewels and fine linen that she may hide the pallid, macerated body that is worn by the suffering that she seeks for and wounded by self-inflicted pain. He possessed a gorgeous cope of crimson silk and gold-thread damask, figured with a repeating pattern of golden pomegranates set in six-petaled formal blossoms, beyond which on either side was the pineapple device wrought in seed pearls. The orphreys were divided into panels representing scenes from the life of the Virgin, and the coronation of the Virgin was figured in coloured silks upon the hood. This was Italian work of the 15th century. Another cope was of green velvet, embroidered with heart-shaped groups of acanthus leaves from which spread long-stemmed white blossoms, the details of which were picked out with silver thread and coloured crystals. The morse bore a seraph's head in gold thread raised work, the orphreys were woven in a diaper of red and gold silk and were starred with medallions of many saints and martyrs, among whom was St. Sebastian. He had chasubles also of amber-coloured silk and blue silk and gold brocade and yellow silk damask and cloth of gold figured with representations of the Passion and Crucifixion of Christ and embroidered with lions and peacocks and other emblems, dalmatics of white satin and pink silk damask decorated with tulips and dolphins and fleur-de-lis, altar frontals of crimson velvet and blue linen, and many corporals, chalice veils and sudaria. In the mystic offices to which such things were put, there was something that quickened his imagination. For these treasures and everything that he collected in his lovely house were to be to him means of forgetfulness, modes by which he could escape for a season from the fear that seemed to him at times to be almost too great to be born. Upon the walls of the lonely locked room where he had spent so much of his boyhood, he had hung with his own hands the terrible portrait, whose changing features showed him the real degradation of his life, and in front of it had draped the purple and gold pall as a curtain. For weeks he would not go there, would forget the hideous painted thing and get back his light heart, his wonderful joyousness, his passionate absorption in mere existence. Then suddenly some night he would creep out of the house, go down to dreadful places near Bluegate Fields, and stay there, day after day, until he was driven away. On his return he would sit in front of the picture, sometimes loathing it and himself, but filled at other times with that pride of individualism that is half the fascination of sin, and smiling with secret pleasure, at the misshapen shadow that had to bear the burden that should have been his own. After a few years he could not endure to be long out of England, and gave up the villa that he had shared at Trouville with Lord Henry, as well as the little white walled-in house at Algiers where they had more than once spent the winter. He hated to be separated from the picture that was such a part of his life, and was also afraid that during his absence someone might gain access to the room in spite of the elaborate bars that he had caused to be placed upon the door. He was quite conscious that this would tell them nothing. It was true that the portrait still preserved, under all the foulness and ugliness of the face, its marked likeness to himself, but what could they learn from that? He would laugh at anyone who tried to taunt him. He had not painted it. What was it to him how vile and full of shame it looked, even if he told them? Would they believe it? Yet he was afraid. Sometimes when he was down at his great house in Nottinghamshire, entertaining the fashionable young men of his own rank who were his chief companions, and astounding the country by the wanton luxury and gorgeous splendour of his mode of life, he would suddenly leave his guests and rush back to town to see that the door had not been tampered with and that the picture was still there. What if it should be stolen? The mere thought made him cold with horror. Surely the world would know his secret then. Perhaps the world already suspected it. For while he fascinated many, there were not a few who distrusted him. He was very nearly blackballed at a West End club, of which his birth and social position fully entitled him to become a member, and it was said that on one occasion, when he was brought by a friend into the smoking room of the Churchill, the Duke of Berwick and another gentleman got up in a marked manner and went out. Curious stories became current about him after he had passed his twenty-fifth year. It was rumoured that he had been seen brawling with foreign sailors in a low den in the distant parts of Whitechapel, and that he consorted with thieves and coiners and knew the mysteries of their trade. His extraordinary absences became notorious, and when he used to reappear again in society, 
Men would whisper to each other in corners, or pass him with a sneer, or look at him with cold, searching eyes, as though they were determined to discover his secret. Of such insolences and attempted slights he, of course, took no notice, and in the opinion of most people his frank debonair manner, his charming boyish smile, and the infinite grace of that wonderful youth that never seemed to leave him, were in themselves a sufficient answer to the calumnies, for so they termed them, that were circulated about him. It was remarked, however, that some of those who had been most intimate with him appeared after a time to shun him. Women who had wildly adored him, and for his sake had braved all social censure and set convention at defiance, were seen to grow pallid with shame or horror if Dorian Gray entered the room. Yet these whispered scandals only increased in the eyes of many his strange and dangerous charm. His great wealth was a certain element of security. Society, civilised society at least, is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are both rich and fascinating. It feels instinctively that manners are of more importance than morals, and, in its opinion, the highest respectability is of much less value than the possession of a good chef. And, after all, it is a very poor consolation to be told that the man who has given one a bad dinner or poor wine is irreproachable in his private life. Even the cardinal virtues cannot atone for half-cold entrees, as Lord Henry remarked once in a discussion on the subject, and there is possibly a good deal to be said for his view. For the canons of good society are, or should be, the same as the canons of art. Form is absolutely essential to it. It should have the dignity of a ceremony, as well as its unreality, and should combine the insincere character of a romantic play with the wit and beauty that makes such plays delightful to us. Is insincerity such a terrible thing? I think not. It is merely a method by which we can multiply our personalities. Such, at any rate, was Dorian Gray's opinion. He used to wonder at the shallow psychology of those who conceive the ego in man as a thing simple, permanent, reliable, and of one essence. To him, man was a being with myriad lives and myriad sensations, a complex, multiform creature that bore within itself strange legacies of thought and passion, and whose very flesh was tainted with the monstrous maladies of the dead. He loved to stroll through the gaunt, cold picture gallery of his country house and look at the various portraits of those whose blood flowed in his veins. Here was Philip Herbert, described by Francis Osborne in his Memoirs on the Reigns of Queen Elizabeth and King James as one who was caressed by the court for his handsome face, which kept him not long company. Was it young Herbert's life that he sometimes led? Had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own? Was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance in Basil Hallward's studio to the mad prayer that had so changed his life? Here, in gold-embroidered red doublet, jewelled surcoat and gilt-edged ruff and wristbands, stood Sir Anthony Sherard, with his silver and black armour piled at his feet. What had this man's legacy been? Had the lover of Giovanna of Naples bequeathed him some inheritance of sin and shame? Were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had not dared to realise? Here, from the fading canvas, smiled Lady Elizabeth Devereux, in her gauze hood, pearled stomacher, and pink-slashed sleeves. A flower was in her right hand, and her left clasped an enamelled collar of white and damask roses. On a table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple. There were large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes. He knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers. Had he something of her temperament in him? These oval, heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him. What of George Willoughby? with his powdered hair and fantastic patches, how evil he looked. The face was saturnine and swarthy, and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain. Delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings. He had been a macaroni of the eighteenth century, and the friend in his youth of Lord Ferrars. What of the second Lord Beckenham, a companion of the Prince Regent in his wildest days, and one of the witnesses at the secret marriage with Mrs. Fitzherbert. How proud and handsome he was with his chestnut curls and insolent pose. What passions had he bequeathed? The world had looked upon him as infamous. 
he had led the orgies at Carlton House. The star of the garter glittered upon his breast. Beside him hung the portrait of his wife, a pallid, thin-lipped woman in black. Her blood also stirred within him. How curious it all seemed. And his mother, with her Lady Hamilton face and her moist, wine-dashed lips, he knew what he had got from her. He had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others. She laughed at him in her loose, bacante dress. There were vine leaves in her hair. The purple spilled from the cup she was holding. The carnations of the painting had withered, but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of colour. They seemed to follow him wherever he went. Yet one had ancestors in literature, as well as in one's own race, nearer perhaps in type and temperament, many of them, and certainly with an influence of which one was more absolutely conscious. There were times when it appeared to Dorian Gray that the whole of history was merely the record of his own life, not as he had lived it in act and circumstance, but as his imagination had created it for him, as it had been in his brain and in his passions. He felt that he had known them all, those strange, terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvellous and evil so full of subtlety. It seemed to him that in some mysterious way their lives had been his own. The hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life had himself known this curious fancy. In the seventh chapter, he tells how, crowned with laurel, lest lightning might strike him, he had sat, as Tiberius, in a garden at Capri, reading the shameful books of Elephantis, while dwarfs and peacocks strutted around him, and the flute player mocked the swinger of the censer, and, as Caligula, had caroused with the green-shirted jockeys in their stables, and supped in an ivory manger with a jewel-frontleted horse, and as Domitian had wandered through a corridor lined with marble mirrors, looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days, and sick with that ennui, that terrible tedium vitae that comes on those whom life denies nothing, and had peered through a clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus, and then, in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules, been carried through the streets of pomegranates to a house of gold, and heard men cry on Nero Caesar as he passed by. And, as Elagabalus had painted his face with colours, and plied the distaff among the women, and brought the moon from Carthage, and given her in mystic marriage to the sun. Over and over again Dorian used to read this fantastic chapter, and the two chapters immediately following, in which, as in some curious tapestries or cunningly wrought enamels, were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad. Filippo, Duke of Milan, who slew his wife and painted her lips with a scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead thing he fondled. Pietro Barbi, the Venetian, known as Paul II, who sought in his vanity to assume the title of Formosus, and whose tiara, valued at 200,000 florins, was bought at the price of a terrible sin. Gian Maria Visconti, who used hounds to chase living men, and whose murdered body was covered with roses by a harlot who had loved him. The Borgia on his white horse, with fratricide riding beside him, and his mantle stained with the blood of Perotto, Pietro Riario, the young Cardinal Archbishop of Florence, child and minion of Sixtus IV, whose beauty was equalled only by his debauchery, and who received Leonora of Aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk, filled with nymphs and centaurs, and gilded a boy that he might serve at the feast as Ganymede or Hylas. Ezelin, whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death, and who had a passion for red blood, as other men have for red wine the son of the fiend, as was reported, and one who had cheated his father at dice when gambling with him for his own soul. Giambattista Cibo, who in mockery took the name of Innocent, and into whose torpid veins the blood of three lads was infused by a Jewish doctor, Sigismondo Malatesta, the lover of Isotta, and the lord of Rimini, whose effigy was burned at Rome as the enemy of God and man, who strangled Polysena with a napkin, and gave poison to Ginerva d'Esta in a cup of emerald, and in honour of a shameful passion built a pagan church for Christian worship. Charles VI, 
who had so wildly adored his brother's wife that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming on him, and who, when his brain had sickened and grown strange, could only be soothed by Saracen cards painted with the images of love and death and madness, and in his trimmed jerkin and jewelled cap and acanthus-like curls, Griffonetto Baglioni, who slew Astore with his bride, and Simonetto with his page, and whose comeliness was such that, as he lay dying in the yellow piazza of Perugia, those who had hated him could not choose but weep, and Atalanta, who had cursed him, blessed him. There was a horrible fascination in them all. He saw them at night, and they troubled his imagination in the day. The Renaissance knew of strange manners of poisoning, poisoning by a helmet and a lighted torch, by an embroidered glove and a jewelled fan, by a gilded pomander and by an amber chain. Dorian Gray had been poisoned by a book. There were moments when he looked on evil simply as a mode through which he could realise his conception of the beautiful.